We return now to our coverage of today's House Rules Committee meeting. Just ahead, it's the panel's discussion on the fiscal year 1993 budget resolution. Later this week, the full United States House of Representatives may begin work on the plan, which serves as the congressional blueprint for taxes and spending. The budget resolution does not require a presidential signature. Last week, in an unusual move, the Budget Committee approved two plans for the House to consider, one which would shift spending from military to domestic programs, and one that would use defense savings for deficit reduction. We now resume our coverage of the committee meeting. The committee and rules will come to order. The matter before the committee this morning is Con Res 287, the budget concurrent resolution of the budget for fiscal year 1993. Very privileged to hear from the chairman of that honorable committee, the Honorable Leon Panetta. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, members of the uh, Rules Committee. Uh, yeah, my testimony will be on the record, and I'll summarize it. Uh, yeah. uh, it's very interesting, something new. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, come before you to ask for a rule on the uh, fiscal year 93 concurrent resolution on the budget, HCON Res 287. Uh, this is the earliest that the House Budget Committee has ever reported a budget resolution uh, since the inception of the congressional budget process in 1975. Uh, and the reason we've acted in an expeditious way is to try to meet the President's uh, wish that we try to move uh, economic packages through the Congress as quickly as possible. And so for that reason, uh, we made the decision that uh, the leadership uh, made the decision that we wanted to move a budget resolution as expeditiously as we could. Uh, the tax bill uh, was brought to the floor last week. Uh, the budget resolution comes up uh, this week. Now, uh, let me mention uh, the reason that we've presented two approaches here uh, in, uh, in the budget resolution itself. Uh, obviously, because we had to expedite getting a budget resolution to the floor, uh, we were left with the uncertainty of what would happen with regards to the Walls legislation. There is legislation pending both in the House and in the Senate to allow for the removal of the wall so that defense uh, savings could be used uh, in domestic uh, areas. Uh, and we don't know what the ultimate uh, conclusion will be with regards to that legislation. Uh, it uh, perhaps could pass the House. We don't know whether it will pass the Senate. We don't know what the President would do with the legislation. And so for that reason, we were left with the uncertainty of what do you then do. Uh, our view was that in order to debate that issue, you had to see in a budget resolution what would happen if, in fact, the walls were to come down, how we would basically dedicate those savings, and that we shouldn't debate the walls legislation without knowing exactly how those funds would be used and where they would be committed. So your bill allows the walls in and you have one for the walls out. That's correct, because so of that uncertainty. Uh, and so the, the members felt, the members of the Budget Committee felt that uh, recognizing that uncertainty, uh, we had to basically operate on two paths because the problem was, had we just taken one path and then, for example, uh, operated on the basis that the walls were coming down, only to find that that would not happen, we would then find ourselves uh, in conference without a proposal relating to the caps or we would have to come back and redo the budget resolution. Uh, on the other hand, we also felt that uh, if, in fact, uh, there should be uh, the Walls legislation should proceed, we needed to be prepared for that alternative as well. So that's the reason we presented uh, this approach, and it basically tries to frame the debate on the issue of what happens ultimately with the Walls. And it also gives the Budget Committee the ability then to go into conference, to be ready to go into conference, whatever happens. As we provided in the legislation, uh, and in the budget resolution, it basically says that if the Conyers bill or similar legislation is not enacted into law before the budget conferees are appointed by the Speaker, 
then the conferees will go into conference with the uh, proposal operating within the caps. So we have basically said if the Walls legislation does not pass or if it is not uh, in law at the time, then we are prepared to take Plan B, which is operating within the caps in the conference. If on the other hand the legislation does pass, then obviously Plan A would be what we would take in the conference to uh, work with the Senate on. Uh, that's the reason we have taken this approach, and we think it uh, makes sense, as I said, in terms of framing the debate. Let me also say that regardless of what approach is here, we basically try to set out some priorities that we think are important in comparison to the President's budget. One, we maintain budget discipline. Under either approach, uh, we operate within the overall spending limits uh, provided by the budget agreement. Under uh, Plan A, even though we can use defense savings for some targeting, uh, we basically say that we're going to operate within the overall discretionary caps uh, that were set by the budget agreement. Under Plan B, obviously, we operate within those caps uh, so that both approaches stick to the budget agreement. Secondly, we reduce the deficit below the President's deficit in both plans. Plan A, because we use defense savings in part for deficit reduction. Plan B, because all of the defense savings go to deficit reduction under that proposal. Three, we get rid of the gimmicks. As you know, uh, I've been very critical of some of the gimmicks in the President's budget, particularly with regards to accrual accounting. We did not resort to any accrual accounting, obviously, in this budget at all. And lastly, we use uh, spending freezes. We basically freeze all domestic spending that we don't target for increases, and we include a 5% cut for the Congress and the Executive Office of the President as well as cabinet and sub-cabinet levels because we think it's very important that Congress and the executive branch set the example for tightening our belts, particularly at a time when uh, the rest of the United States uh, is facing some uh, the difficulties of a recession. Secondly, on fairness, uh, both proposals reject the President's uh, cuts in what we think are cuts aimed at the most disadvantaged in our society. Uh, Medicare cuts of $13.9 billion, almost $14 billion over five years were rejected in both plans. Veterans cuts of $3.5 billion are rejected. Civil service retirement and pay cuts of $5.5 billion. We reject uh, the requirement to increase their contributions to the retirement plans. We reject the three-month delay for civil service pay because we think that's, that frankly is discriminatory against federal employees and we reject uh, the permanency of the lump sum uh, exclusion, which is also included in the President's budget. Mass transit, uh, which was cut significantly, almost a billion dollar cut in the President's budget, we rejected that. Rejected cuts in higher ed, in low income housing, community development, economic development, and low income energy assistance. Uh, so those are the areas where we rejected the President's proposals because we think they're unfair in terms of those constituencies that were affected. And lastly, we basically try to target our savings to areas that we think we need to invest in. And we basically target the same areas under both plans. First of all, let me mention on the defense number. The defense number was arrived at not by simply grabbing into a bag the, the way some proposals have been made, I think, on both sides of the hill, uh, that somehow there was this huge uh, peace dividend that uh, could be derived at and theref therefore spent. But what we basically asked was for the Armed Services Committee and the Chairman of the Armed Services Committee to engage in looking at a bottom-to-top review of our defense needs. Uh, the Chairman of that committee, Les Aspen, has done that, and he's developed several strategies that the committee will now debate over these next few weeks. What he recommended was that for the first year in 93, based on those strategies, that we could achieve savings uh, in defense on outlays of anywhere from 8 to 10 billion, uh, and in uh, budget authority anywhere from 12 to 15 billion. What we did was we basically said we're going to take uh, the 10 billion in outlays, 15 billion in budget authority, but one of those will be given back for economic conversion. Uh, and depending on what plan you follow, uh, the savings are used in this manner. Uh, for plan A, we take about 6.4 billion for investment. About $2.6 billion is for deficit reduction under Plan A, and $1 billion is for conversion. Under Plan B, which operates within the caps, uh, $1 billion would go to conversion, and the remainder would go to deficit reduction. 
That's why the deficit under Plan B is significantly below the President's, but also Plan A is also below the President's, as I pointed out. The three areas that we focused on are very limited in terms of what we think uh, we need to invest in. They are very targeted. One is education, because we think that education is probably the most important investment we could make as a country as we enter this next century. On education, our, we put about $4.2 billion into education programs, $800 million into the Head Start program because we want to fully fund Head Start uh, by the end of this decade. And the other areas in elementary and secondary and higher education where we basically double the President's number to $3.7 billion. Uh, one area I would just draw your attention to is the student loan area, the Pell Grant area. The President cuts 400,000 students under his Pell Grant approach. We rejected that. Under our approach, we would add 500,000 students uh, would become eligible under this proposal because we think that's an extremely important area for, uh, for the future. Health care is the other area we targeted. And there we set aside about $4.3 billion for health care areas. One is WIC. And everyone here knows and is supportive, I think, of the WIC program because it works. We put about $400 million into that program because we want to move towards full funding by mid-decade. Health research, uh, the NIH, we basically double the President's number in NIH because of the need to uh, increase research uh, in that area. Low-income health and immunizations, there I would just draw your attention to one number. We put $150 million into immunizations, which is much more than what the President put in. And that would allow for about 3 million kids, 3 to 4 million kids, to be immunized under 6 years of age. And that's something we should have done, frankly, a long time ago. So that's one of the targets we aimed at in terms of immunization. AIDS, we uh, basically uh, triple the President's number, try, allowing for full funding for the Ryan White uh, bill, as well as increased research. And on veterans health care, we add about another 100 million to uh, veterans health care, which would cover about another 100,000 veterans. And finally, on jobs and long-term economic growth and conversion. This is an area where we think we have to make a significant investment. Let me just draw your attention to one area, infrastructure. We passed a highways bill last year. The President basically says we ought to put a small amount into that highways bill. Our approach was that if the President and the Congress agreed on a highways bill, we ought to put that full number into the budget. And that's what we did. The, uh, the number triples the amount that uh, is contained in the President's budget. And I might add, it would produce anywhere from 50 to 100,000 jobs if we put that number into infrastructure. Mass transit, I told you, we not only restored the President's cut, but we also increased by 500 million the amount we would put into mass transit. That's about 28,000 jobs that would be created in that uh, area alone. Job training, we uh, felt that job training and particularly dislocated workers is an area that we have to put money in because of the dislocations that are taking place uh, within our own society right now. Uh, we add a significant amount for dislocated workers to try to cover about 95,000 of uh, those workers under this proposal. In housing, the President has a very heavy cut in low-income housing, as uh, we've seen in past budgets, almost a billion-dollar cut in low-income housing and rural housing. Uh, we basically felt that uh, this is an area where we ought to be targeting investments. So we put $2.7 billion in Plan A and $1.2 billion in Plan B. The other area I want to mention is CDBGs and EDA. The President would virtually eliminate those two programs under his budget. If there's any program that's important to economic conversion, and let me tell you, I, this is, I, I'm telling you this from a first-hand point of view, because I have a base that's closing in my district. If it weren't for the availability of CDBG and EDA, we would have a very hard time doing the kind of planning we need to do for the future. And so both CDBG and EDA are given an increase of $260 million uh, in these proposals. And lastly, on energy, while the President cuts uh, energy proposals, we feel we need about $430 million for conservation, research, and development on energy proposals so that hopefully we can eventually become energy independent in this country. Those are the areas. I, I know these are all numbers. But as always in a budget resolution, these numbers also reflect people. Uh, the argument last week on the tax bill is where are the jobs? Let me tell you where the jobs are in this proposal. We estimate that with the investments we have proposed in this budget, 
that we could provide close to 200,000 jobs, largely in infrastructure, but also in mass transit, as well as in aviation, Social Security Administration. We provide an increase to try to provide for a proper coverage of the applications that are made through the Social Security Administration. In addition, the low-income housing and the rural housing, we think, are also job producers. Uh, so we're talking about 200,000 jobs. In addition to that, under education, we're allowing 37,000 kids to get Head Start coverage, and about 500,000 students, as I said, under Pell Grants. 600,000 women under the WIC program could get care as a result of what we're putting there, and about uh, 1.3 million would be able to pay low-income energy bills as a result of what we also put into this bill. Those are people, real people, and that's what we've tried to target in this budget resolution. As I said, we're trying to frame the debate uh, on the Conyers legislation because that'll ultimately be the vote that, that will decide what path we take. We felt we had to present both paths in this budget resolution so that members could see what will happen if we can move some defense money into investments and what will happen if we have to stay within the caps. But I can assure you that under both, we tried to do our best to protect the priorities that we think are important to people and to this country. Mr. Chairman, I might, uh, I might just add for purposes of the rule that as always uh, we would ask that uh, you allow only for budget substitutes as opposed to uh, amendments, shotgun amendments on the budget resolution. Uh, secondly, we would uh, ask uh, for uh, some two to three hours for debate, including uh, time for the Joint Economic Committee. I think one hour may be enough for them, although I know they have much more. But last year we gave them two hours and they didn't use all of that time, so perhaps one hour would be sufficient. Uh, I think an hour on each of the amendments, uh, maybe with the exception of Dannemeyer, uh, perhaps 30 minutes might be sufficient on Dannemeyer, but I, I'd be happy to take an hour on that as well. An hour on the President's budget, and uh, on the Black Caucus budget, uh, uh, I will leave that time up to you because I know that they do want some additional time to be able to fully debate their proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you for uh, showing uh, the difference between the A and B and, and what, where the money would go if if the walls were to come down. I know that's been a subject of much debate this morning. That's what I understand. And uh, I think that your very careful and illustration of uh, where the money go. And also, I, I uh, commend you for allowing both uh, budgets, the A and B, in the, your budget so that the uh, people can determine which way they want to go. And so you don't have to go through this process once again. So I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Solomon. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, there's no need to uh, get into a lengthy debate. Since we had a two-hour debate earlier, uh, that you were gracious enough to put up with, and uh, uh, let me uh, address the Let me, uh, let me just first of all commend uh, the Chairman, uh, who we have a great deal of respect for. We say often uh, in bringing us uh, Plan B, you know, the, uh, the budget which is within the caps and which is within the budget agreement. And, uh, you know, that means so much to all of us and the American people that we stay within that agreement. Uh, so I, I appreciate that. Uh, when you mentioned, however, Mr. Chairman Panetta, that uh, the President's budget uh, cuts 400,000 students and student aid, et cetera, and I heard some other, you know, uh, criticism of the President's budget. But uh, I never hear a word when we talk about cutting military jobs. And you know, even President Bush's budget, which cuts our military uh, budget by 25% over the next five years, will cost 500,000 jobs. And as I have looked at your, uh, your budget, uh, you'd cut a million jobs. We have two million men and women under arms today. And I went to, at length, to talk about, you know, just how valuable those young people are today and what their jobs mean to, to America. I mean, not just defending America, because that's fine and we need them, 
But I talked about such things as uh, those young people coming from the inner cities, from broken homes, where they didn't have but one parent, sometimes no parents. And, you know, they learn discipline and respect. They learn uh, to be polite and courteous. They learn how to live with the rule of law. They learn for the first time, coming out of their neighborhoods, they learn what rules and laws are all about. And they learn not to use illegal drugs. It's so terribly important today. And they learn all of these, these, these principles. And you know, when, they're, when, they're, when they turn in their uniforms and their service is over, whether they've served three years or five years or 20, their service is done, where do they go? They go back to where they came from. And they take these ingrained principles with them that they never got because they didn't have a home or they weren't taught in our school systems. And they become citizens. And that rubs off back home. You know, so here we're talking about cutting a million jobs. God's sakes, let's, let's worry about, you know, those kind of jobs that we're losing as well. And what those people do when they go back as citizens like you and me and they spread that, that gospel of those principles back home. Uh, enough on that. But let me just talk to you about what you said about uh, uh, how important the Conyers bill is. And you said that tells the real story. I would suggest that what we do so that we don't waste this body's time is when your budget comes to the floor that you allow my amendment or Mr. Gratison's amendment, which would abolish, knock out Plan A. That is what Conyers' bill does. In other words, if that bill, if, if that amendment then fails on the floor of the House, then it's all over. You have the votes and you can proceed through your conference and the Senate will know where we stand in the House. You have the votes to knock out the firewall. If you lose, then that's the vote. We don't have to worry about this bill that we de debated two hours earlier, which is going to die on the vine, my friend. I mean, here are 40, and I understand there are 48 now, Democrats from wide spectrums. There are some liberals on here, some conservative Democrats, moderates, going to vote against that firewall, knocking out the firewall. The bill is dead on arrival. And even if it did pass the House, it's going to be, and the Senate, it's going to be vetoed. So why hold everybody in limbo about what's going to happen to plan A or B? You sit here and testify and make that amendment in order. And let's take the vote on the floor right then and there, and we don't have to waste anybody's time. What do you think of that? Well, it's, uh, obviously, I think that Push your button. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the, uh, you have to at least uh, give respect to the Conyers uh, proposal in the sense that I think the membership ought to vote up or down on Conyers. It has a pretty clear direction. He's basically saying we ought to, uh, if we want to remove the walls, uh, then we ought to have that vote up or down on that issue. And I, and I think that's probably right. I think the purpose of our providing Plan A is basically to indicate what would happen if, if in the event uh, that legislation were to move forward. I, I understand the opposition to it, and, and obviously it created uncertainty for us on the Budget Committee as to what path we would follow. However, I have to tell you that, uh, for example, the President's comments today in Atlanta about uh, the worst mistake he ever made was agreeing to the budget deal. Uh, raised some questions in my mind about exactly where the President stands on this proposal. Secondly, uh, in the budget resolution itself, Mr. Darman raised the, uh, the prospect that if we don't like uh, the accounting, the accrual accounting, that in fact defense savings could be used for purposes of funding the tax cut. So that the specter was raised that perhaps even the administration might support some approach to that. So it's not totally out of the question. And I guess what I would say is uh, let's have that vote on its own merits and see where that goes. I think uh, for members, very frankly, it's pretty clear where we go. If, uh, if that legislation does not pass, uh, then obviously we're going to be going in with Plan B. That's going to be our negotiating position. I appreciate the gentleman. That's exactly what I wanted to do. I understand. I understand. Up front, I had, and then we know where we all uh, let, me, uh, let me just finish up just to find out how we're going to structure the rule. Because you asked for, you know, about two hours of general debate and about an hour of joint, uh, for the joint economics, and an hour for the president. And uh, I didn't hear, uh, uh, oh, and you said some time for the Black Caucus. Uh, I think the Black Caucus would like some significant time. An hour or time. less. I, I'm afraid they, they, would like, uh, they would like to have uh, a number of hours for the okay. debate on and, the uh, And I didn't hear the Dannemeyer budget mentioned. You don't object to him offering no. his amendment? No. His, his the chairman uh, doesn't object. Okay. So we'd have some time for him as well. Then. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Well, again, I commend the gentleman and thank you thank for coming you. for us. Okay.
Mr. Derrick. Chairman, the Dynamite budget is historic. Uh, it's part of, uh, the, uh, of, of, of every budget resolution. I think probably reason to suspect that it will be part of this one. You know, I think we need to understand that this is a free enterprise society. This is a market-moved uh, uh, society that we are part of. This is not a military, industrial, complex society. Now, you know, I feel for men and women who are in the defense industry uh, who are losing their jobs. I feel for people in the military uh, who find themselves out on the, uh, on the job market, as we all do. But the fact of the matter is, the American taxpayer, together with our military people over the last 45 years, won the Cold War. It's primarily over. To sit here and to say that we are going to be so rigid that we are not going to change the way we look at our budget priorities, we're in the middle of, I guess, the second deepest recession that we've had since 1945. Uh, what we need to do is, the future of our youth in this country does not lie in the military. Th their future, their self-respect, lies in we as a country being able to provide them with jobs so that they are able to support their families, to educate their children, to provide health care and the other things that they want uh, for the kind of lifestyle that, that most of us would want. We don't do that through the military. What we need to do is, number one, quit uh, 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 using 7 or 8 percent of our gross national product for military and compete against countries who are using 1 or 2 percent. And what we need to, I noticed that out of every billion dollars that we cut the defense budget, that means 10,000 new jobs, additional jobs, uh, in the private sector. This is where the future of our country lies. Now, you know, the Soviet Union fell for a number of reasons, and one of the primary reasons is that they could no longer afford the horrendous military establishment that they have. Our country is not a country that is dedicated to these tremendous standing uh, uh, military. Uh, we are a free enterprise, a private sector economy, and that is where the future of our youth lies. And I commend you, Mr. Chairman, on your on the amount that you've taken out of, of the military the budget. I commend you on the amount that you have, have tried to, to use to create jobs and, and to get these people who are coming out of the military, who have done a wonderful job, but to, so there'll be something there for them. Let me first of all say that uh, I wanted to be very careful about what we did in defense because I'm very sensitive to that issue in terms of its impact. And uh, that was the reason we asked the chairman of the Armed Services Committee. I didn't tell you. That's, that's the reason we asked the chairman of the Armed Services Committee to look and, and be able to give us a number that he felt was doable and it was tied to a four year plan as to where we were going to go with the defense budget. You can't, again, you can't just grab bag the defense budget. It has to be tied to policy and it has to be tied to the kind of threats that we're going to confront. Let me, let me mention on your, your last point, and I mentioned this to Mr. Solomon as well. Uh, this is not easy. We're going to go through a hell of a transition over these next few years as we try to grind down defense spending. Even under the President's plan, we're talking about significant impact. Uh, I know what we're going through. I've got a base in my district that's closing. Uh, Fort Ord is in the process of uh, uh, an installation that's on the list. Uh, that's not easy. It represents, obviously, a number of jobs in the area. It represents uh, a significant economic impact. And, and I can tell you that when it first happened, the community kind of went through the throes of, what are we going to do? How are we going to confront this? because a good portion of our economy is dependent on the military budget, as are many communities throughout the country. But as we worked through some, some citizen task forces, as we began to look at options, you know, we finally began to see that this could be a great opportunity. I mean, right now we have the potential of having a state university campus at Fort Ord. The infrastructure is there. Maybe we'll have a 15,000 to 20,000 student campus there. Eventually, the community is going to be able to make use of that 
it'll probably be even an even better investment for the future. Uh, I, I think the community now recognizes that this is an opportunity. Uh, and I think most communities are going to have to face this. I mean, I, it is, it's not easy. I, I, I'm the last one to tell you it's easy because of what I see happening. But on the other hand, I'm the last one to say that it shouldn't happen because we are going to have to. I mean, defense policy in this country can't be based on the fact that it's social policy in terms of jobs or teaching kids what they otherwise ought to know. And I served two years in the Army, so I know what it can do. Uh, it has to be based on what we need to meet our threats what we need for national security. That's the basis for the defense budget. And if the threats are there, then I'm willing to put money in the defense budget. But if the threats aren't there, then let me assure you that there are other areas where we can, we can dedicate some investment that frankly during the 80s got lost in the shuffle. They got lost. We reduced discretionary spending by almost 25% during the 80s. We tripled the defense budget. Uh, and a lot of people got hurt in that process. And now the time has come to try to maybe reestablish some of that balance. That's all. <clears throat> um, I, I was listening to Mr. Solomon very uh, closely, and he makes some very good points about releasing these people from the military who have really learned their citizenship there. But I know after World War II, that we had a great program that everybody thought was going to be a big loser, the GI Bill of Rights, that, that, that carried on when people left the military. And I'm sure there are educational plans, as you enumerated in your bill, that w will help it. And I'm sure that uh, it's not going to be able to take care of every person in the military. There'll, there'll have to be other jobs, training, uh, and, and some other situations to take care of them. And I. I know what you're wrestling with, and it's not easy when you try to move this kind of money around and satisfy two uh, distinct communities sometimes. But uh, I, I commend you for all your work, and, uh, and I just hope that uh, you, you keep it up. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Leon, I join with Chairman Moakley in congratulating you for your effort here. Uh, obviously, this is a, a, a difficult struggle for all of us. We're going through this transition, and it's, it's not easy. This morning, we had uh, a uh, rather heated discussion about the question of defense expenditures. Mr. Solomon feels very strongly uh, as a, a proud former Marine uh, and uh, he, he should be. I mean, he's fought for this country, and he has some very strong convictions. He just took umbrage, as I'm sure anyone in the military would, with the statement that Mr. Derrick made a few minutes ago about uh, the fact that young people really don't have a future that uh, is in the military, and, and uh, that there should be some other things that people look to rather than the military. But Jerry is a guy who's a product of the military, and he feels very strongly about it. And I think that we are going to still see a military after all the preamble of our Constitution. It makes it very clear that General, providing... Mr. Uh, Happy to yield to my friend. That, uh, they didn't have a, a, a future in the military. I said that the youth of this country, that their future does not lie in the military. It lies in a, an economy that provides them with a job to support their families, to educate their children, and to buy those other things. Of course, there'll always be some people in the military. Happy to yield to my friend from New York. Would you, would you yield, please? Happy yeah, to yield See, my that's friend. the part I take the umbrage about, it's people inferring that a job in the military is not an honorable job. I mean, it's as honorable a job as your job here in Mr. this Congress. Mr. Mr. Salma, when have I said that well, it wasn't an honorable job? That's it, the most my, ridiculous thing I've ever It's my opinion. That's what you're saying. Well, then you just said get a real job in the private well, well, sector. Well, say it's your opinion and don't say it's what I said. It's my opinion, Mr. Derrick. Right, thank you. Okay, good. So I would say to my friend from South Carolina, was I correct that Mr. Solomon took umbrage with what was said? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, well, well, I'll tell you quite frankly, Mr. Solomon takes umbrage with a lot of what I say. <laughs> it's Butler. <laughs> he thinks my name is, is Derek Butler and I'm from North Carolina, but other than that, everything's all right. One of the things uh, that, uh, that I've looked at here, Leon, is that uh, when you look at the uh, OMB 
um, outlays as they're uh, projected up to 97. I've got the two charts here. Uh, one shows defense outlays dropping 512 billion up to uh, 97, and then domestic outlays increasing 1.3 trillion up to 97. And I just think that that uh, there is a great deal of concern um, on the part of many the American people and many on this side of the aisle about continuing down that road. Obviously, uh, you know, I acknowledge that during the decade of the 80s there there were some problems. I mean, everything didn't go perfectly, even though we saw the longest peacetime economic expansion in history. Uh, we still uh, did have some problems. But, and, and I'm just going to reiterate a point that I made earlier this morning. I mean, if you look at, at cuts in defense and juxtapose that to uh, 1.3 trillion as you head out to 1997, it seems that we in the Congress are creating what the rest of the world is fleeing, uh, heading down this road of increasing domestic expenditures. And that's just something that, that does concern me greatly. Um, and I congratulate you on the work of the committee and all. So I, I look at the overview uh, that came out of this. It's called Overview, a Budget to Restore America's Future. And it's a little perplexing to look at the title, a budget to restore America's future. And I wonder, how do you restore something that hasn't happened yet, um, as, as I look at that? And, and I wonder, what is it that we're trying to restore? Is it uh, uh, fiscal responsibility? I mean, it seems to me that we're not doing that too well. I mean, you've quoted the president's statement this morning in Atlanta, uh, and uh, we've obviously got disagreement here. I don't know exactly what you're trying to restore as far as the future is concerned with this package. Well, let me, uh, let me speak to that because uh, basically we did a, as you may know, a 10-year look at uh, the future. And the problem is that there is no future there. There is no there there right now because uh, right now what we see are obviously tremendously increasing deficits, as you know. Uh, we're now at 350, uh, we'll be at 399. Uh, we'll be at 350 next year. Uh, we're trying to grind that down a little bit. But the problem is that it increases even in the out years if we don't control health care costs. And obviously that's eroding uh, our resources for the future. And uh, in addition to that, obviously, when we're facing these needs within our own society, whether it's education, whether it's health care, whether it's growth, research and development, uh, the kind of investments we ought to be making, we don't have the resources to do that. We just don't have the resources to do that because of the, uh, the deficits that we're running into. And I guess the problem I see is I don't see any future out there. I really don't. I don't see any great future for this country unless we start reordering our priorities and tightening our belt and trying to establish some discipline for the future. Uh, that's the key, and I guess that's why we use that particular well, title. I, I mean, I totally agree with you, Leon, that I'm, obviously we have to, to reorder our priorities. And I, All I'm saying is that when I look at the, at the defense level and juxtapose it to the domestic level, yeah. um, it, it just seems to me that that is not reordering our priorities. It is really perpetuating the same kind of spending levels that we've experienced for the past several decades. And that's, that's really what I see as a problem as far as reordering it. And obviously our, you know, our priorities are No, I understand. I, and I understand where you're coming from uh, in terms of, you know, we, I, we would probably... Yeah, you were there once, right? We would disagree probably <laughs> as to uh, uh, priorities uh, as to what ought to be targeted. But uh, I think the, 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 what you're seeing now is a situation where if there are savings that can be achieved in defense and they're legitimate, uh, the question then becomes, can some of them be committed to deficit reduction and some committed to areas where we think uh, we need that kind of investment? That's, that's the fundamental issue. On the defense budget, and I recognize your concerns about where we take the defense budget, I don't know what that path really ought to look like in the future. I mean, there are, there are a number of paths that everybody suggested. Mm -hmm. The President suggested a $50 billion path over five years makes sense. Phil Graham says $160 billion uh, line makes sense over the next five years. Uh, McCain, Senator McCain, suggested $230 billion might make sense over five years. I think he's moving off of that number very fast, but he suggested that. Uh, Les Aspen said that there are about four different paths you could take that might go less than the president up to about uh, anywhere close to $180 billion. Uh, the, what we have done here is a path that probably would take us somewhere in the vicinity of maybe 90 billions in, in that vicinity over the next four to five years. Uh, 
I don't think that's, that's out of the question. I think that's probably pretty responsible planning based on where uh, we think defense ought to go. Uh, none of this, as I said, is going to be easy. I mean, even doing the president's budget is not going to be easy. But I also think we need to recognize what changes have taken place in the world, and I think we've got to tell our people we're smart enough to make use of that to try to meet some of these needs. I don't think there's a Republican here. There isn't a Republican here that disagrees with the uh, priorities that we've set. You're for Head Start. You're for elementary and secondary. You're for Pell Grants. You're for WIC. You're for uh, increased health research, veterans health care. Uh, I think you're for uh, programs related to highways and mass transit, infrastructure. I think uh, we're all for uh, trying to provide for energy uh, development. I mean, those are issues, my God, we ought to be joining hands on. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, the president, to the credit of the president, he put some money into these programs mm -hmm. because he cares about that. Mm -hmm. So obviously, we just need to work better together to try to target some of these priorities. You mentioned, Leon, the, the uh, defense question, and, uh, and I have one of the, the quotes that came from uh, Les Aspen's letter to you in which he says, the Committee on Armed Services has only recently started its review of the President's fiscal year 93 defense budget proposal. It would be a mistake if the fiscal year 93 defense numbers as reflected in the budget resolution prejudge the Committee's estimate about which option represents the most appropriate force in the future. Right. The, uh, according to the chairman, uh, that number would basically allow him to follow any of the four strategies that are being debated by the Armed Services Committee now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, because the point was I didn't want to do anything in 93 that would inhibit the debate that has to take place in armed services over these next few weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, let, me, let me just ask a final question about the entitlement issue. About 85 percent of the entitlement programs are means tested. Is that an appropriate figure, would you say? I'm not sure if it's 85 percent, but I'll take your word for it. Yeah, I mean, that's just a number that I've been given. One of the things that I was struck with the other day is I saw that the chairman of the board of Metropolitan Life said that if you extrapolate the current budget out to 2029, it'll consist of just two items, entitlement 69 percent and interest on the debt 31 percent. And what I was wondering is if you think that we should move further in the direction of more means testing. I think we need to move in the direction of greater control of entitlements. And uh, whether you do it through means testing uh, or whether you do it through establishing some kind of controls over where entitlements are going, uh, I'm in, frankly in favor of both. I, I think uh, we, met, we basically recommended that in the 10-year plan, and uh, I'm prepared to try to work in that area. I have to, I have to tell you that the, the problem we ran into is that Normally, would, we would implement that with reconciliation instructions. But very frankly, uh, the feeling was we should not do reconciliation because of the uh, debate on the tax bill and the mm -hmm. fact that uh, reconciliation would then offer another opportunity for an additional tax bill mm -hmm. or a tax cut bill. And for that reason, we didn't include it. We did put in very specific instructions, however, that if any health care proposal is to move, any kind of health reform measure is to move, it ought to include cost controls. Mm -hmm. as part of that measure. Are you supportive of the Conyers proposal, or what's your position? Well, I don't know that we ought to open it as wide as Mr. Conyers would like to do, but obviously I think to the extent that we kind of redirect some of these savings, I don't mind making small readjustments for that purpose, but mm -hmm. I'm a little concerned about just opening it up altogether. Mm -hmm. Thanks again. Thanks, Leon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief because we're Take almost an hour now. We're still on our first witness. All I really wanted to do was commend my, my chairman, my other chairman, Mr. Panetta, for the very good work he's done over the past couple of months on with the Budget Committee. As you all can imagine, as Mrs. Slaughter and I have had to sit through, uh, it's been a very difficult, albeit very useful, kind of of exercise. Mr. Panetta has had to deal with a variegated number of of um, Democrats as well as. Of course, of course, with with Republicans, some of whom don't don't agree with what he's proposing to do, and I'll, I just wanted to, to say to him and to others that he's done an excellent excellent job, and I think, frankly, what the what the budget committee has come out with, which is these two alternative plans, is extremely useful for the membership. They may not like it; they don't have to vote for both of them. May not want to vote for either, but it really makes it really shows us what the choices that we have to make, and, and to a certain extent, as I think Mr. Panetta was saying earlier, um, puts it in human terms. I mean, you, you really see what the differences between the two plans are. One can believe in theory, as almost all of us do, that any defense savings ought to be committed to reducing the deficit. 
although you're not sure whether four or five or six billion dollars makes a great deal of difference when you're looking at a four hundred billion dollar deficit doesn't mean you shouldn't keep working at it but on the other hand if you take those four or five or six billion dollars and put them into some of the programs that we've been talking about today you can understand uh, what good it might do for a few hundred thousand at least Americans in terms of providing jobs or better health care or more immunizations or whatever and that's just a, you know a choice what we all have to make but I think it's I, I think it's commendable of the of the of the chairman and the budget committee, which he which he runs very well. That it has in fact offered that choice to the to the to the members of the House and to the to the to the Congress in general, whether or not you approve of, the, of the, that way of doing it. I think it's it's been a very useful thing. I was only going to make one other comment, which I think Mr. Panetta, you just covered in response to Dave Dreyer's question. And that is to make it clear to our friends here that the numbers which are in here, both for budget authority and for outlay with respect to defense. Uh, we specifically asked, you specifically asked, and Mr. Aspen specifically told us that we are not committing ourselves to any particular path, uh, any of his four options or any other alternative option over the next four, five, or six years by, by accepting the numbers that are here. Those options will be, th those choices, in fact, will be made by Mr. Mr. Aspen's own authorizing committee, and Mr. Bennett and others will be making those choices. And in fact, of course, over the period of next two or three or four years, depending on what happens in the world, those, those pathways will be changed up or down in response to a perceived increase in threats or perhaps continued decrease in the, in the number or the amount of threats that are facing us. So we're not committing ourselves uh, other than in, in this first year's, uh, these first year's numbers. They, they can apply and will apply equally to any one of the, the four levels of options that Mr. Aspen has been talking about. So don't worry about that as a, as a specific issue. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Leon, uh, Briefly, um, I'm trying to get a, a handle on where we're going to be. Um, how, how much total debate time are we talking about all this added together? Uh, Martin, I think, uh, I think we're looking at about three hours for total debate. If, uh, in other words, two hours, uh, an hour for each of us uh, mm -hmm. divided on the resolution itself, an hour uh, divided 30 minutes on each side for that. Uh, so it's three hours of total debate. Uh, then we would do, a, as I said, an hour then on the amendments with the exception of the Black Caucus, which uh -huh. I believe want uh, more extensive debate on their proposal. And an hour on the rule, of course. That's correct. Uh, are we contemplating doing this all tomorrow, or are we contemplating doing this, uh, splitting this over to Thursday? Well, w what I would suggest is that if uh, tomorrow we could uh, complete uh, general debate and uh, hopefully move to votes on two of the amendments. Uh, by tomorrow, late tomorrow, mm -hmm. and then take up uh, the remaining issues on Thursday. That would be, I think, I, my hope is to try to complete action by late, uh, not late tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, late Thursday afternoon. Well, it wouldn't actually be late if, you've, uh, if you're doing part of it on Wednesday. It doesn't sound like we'd go too late on Thursday. Well, it depends on how much time is provided for the Black Caucus debate. All right, let me ask uh, also, uh, Leon, you were asked the question a moment ago, and I just want to make sure that I'm clear on this, because Mr. Conyers has several bills floating around. Yeah. Uh, I, the question, I, I suppose, was on the, the bill that would, uh, out of government ops, it would uh, eliminate the walls. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand what you said. I, I, I support moving the defense money over into some areas. I think, I, I guess my preference would be if we just reduce the caps by the amount that we've reflected in the budget resolution, that that might be a better way to do it than simply just eliminating the walls. But I mean, I, I, I do support moving some of those funds over into domestic areas. Are we are we necessarily going to have a range of choices uh, when we consider that I, legislation I, next I, week? I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> I know you're facing a number of amendments. Um, well, the, the question is, Leon is suggesting some sort of modified approach to the Conyers bill, and I'm just wondering if we're really going to have that type of, an, I mean, if whether you, we're if, going to have a if, partial destruction of the walls or whether we're going to if have you didn't, If you didn't do the modified approach, I'd still support moving it over. So, right. I mean, that's where I'm going. I do think that uh, the uh, work that the Budget Committee has done on uh, defense conversion is important. Uh, obviously, uh, there would be more money if, uh, under the alternative budget, if the walls are down. That's correct. Um, About five billion dollars in the conversion fees. Leon, if the walls remain up, um, there is a billion dollars within the DOD function itself. That's correct. And there is some other limited money 
within other functions. Uh, it appears to me to be pretty limited. That's correct. Much more, it's much more limited. I think you'd have to be much more imaginative on the defense uh, committees to try to target some additional money into conversion. It's not out of the question. I mean, I, I think you could take some of those savings and perhaps do something a little more creative in terms of conversion if we have to operate within the caps. But you'd have to get OMB's blessing on that. Otherwise, it could be sequestered. Mm -hmm. but, but there is clearly, under either approach, there's one billion set aside That's correct. Uh, within the defense uh, That's function correct. for this purpose. Okay, I have no other questions. Leon. Uh, Leon, so all the programs that you enumerated earlier were based on the walls coming down. Yeah, there's, there's no question that we can make uh, significant, uh, say, significant targeted investments. And that's, uh, with those funds if the walls come down. I and mean, that's why your committee is coming out with both options, so correct. they can decide. Members need to look at that and yeah. see what the difference is. I mean, you can't, there's no way you can do the infrastructure piece. There is no way you can do the infrastructure number based on the highway bill uh, unless you're able to adjust some of these uh, savings. Right. That's just the bottom line. So you give them a chance to compare side by side which right. option they want to go with. That's right. And then members will ultimately then cast their vote on Conyers as to whether or not that happens or not. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Chairman, as I have stated before in this committee, um, Tennesseans are hurting and our country is hurting. Americans hurting all over the country because of the recession. And it's time that the President and Congress work together to develop policies for both the short-term and long-term growth in this country. I think that's very important. And I want to compliment Leon on his leadership in bringing this budget before us so quickly. It's the first or the quickest that a budget's ever been brought before Congress, uh, due, uh, if not solely, certainly to a great extent because of Leon's pushing and moving as chairman of the committee to get this budget done. I thank you for that. This is the first step. We need to take it and, and move on so we can provide relief for this country. Thanks. Slaughter. Nielsen can uh, that we we achieved this with almost around the clock hearings uh, and and I'm I'm very proud of it and under Leon's leadership we uh, we've learned a lot we've learned about fairness and statesmanship and and biting bullets and I want to assure all the members of this committee that we were mindful throughout of the the economic disruption uh, we knew that states that were losing plants and bases were going to be hurting and that we had to had to take that into account. We talked about bringing troops back and what it would mean uh, economically and trying to put people back to work. That's the reason for the economic conversion money. But it's also, Mr. Chairman, the reason for the EDA money, for the CDBG money. And if I could throw in one personal point from my part of the country that Jerry and I represent, for the past 45 years, Jerry, New Yorkers have sent more money to Washington than they got back or benefited from. For the most part, that money's gone to the southern tier states and places with heavy defense industries where they, then we felt that we'd all benefited from it. But it's time we paid some attention to home. And we, rep we have a railroad system, for example, around us that uh, moves very little faster than it did 100 years ago. We've got a nice 19th century railroad system. And for the first time, thank God, Leon, we put a little money in there for studying maglev and high-speed rail and making some changes. And we're going to benefit from that as well as the rest of this country, and we need to try to keep up with some economic partners. So all in all, I think we not only took care of the defense needs of this country, we had acknowledgement that the Cold War is over, and we're saying we're going to start taking care of the people who live here and who look to us for the leadership. And thank, I'm very thankful for Leon for his leadership in getting this done. And, and join all my colleagues on this side who say it's been miraculous that we've been able to put out a budget this good, this fair, and this thorough so quick. Thank you, Leon. Thank you very much, Ms. Lada. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very uh, intense explanation of your plan, too. Together. Yeah. We'll now hear from the Honorable Willis Gratison of Ohio and the Honorable Minority Whip, the Newt Gingrich from Georgia.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you know, Mr. Chairman, I have already uh, uh, communicated with the committee in writing to request that the President's budget be made in order uh, as an alternative to the uh, budget which our Chairman just described to you. And a copy of the amendment has been forwarded, of the proposed amendment has been forwarded to the committee. Uh, my amendment would replace the twin budgets in the concurrent budget re resolution with a single budget. Uh, whatever reservations one might have about the uh, President's priorities and spending choices, at least he's made some decisions, which is not the case with regard to the resolution reported by the Budget Committee. It has Plan A and Plan B. They're mutually inconsistent, and there'll be no opportunity unless your rule provides it for the House to make a choice uh, between the two plans. The Chairman of the Budget Committee has made quite a point about all the glorious new spending initiatives uh, that are recommended uh, by the committee. Every one of these, Mr. Chairman, is fictional. These are fictional investments because they're all based upon Plan A, the assumption that the Budget Enforcement Act of 1990 is going to be modified. It isn't going to be modified. The real budget is Plan B since it adheres to the current law and I have no doubt in my mind that when the budget conference meets the law that we have today will be the law that is in effect then with regard to the fire walls. This involves making difficult choices and I'll say this about Plan B and while it isn't while it doesn't include the choices that I would make it at least does conform with the Budget Enforcement Act and it does make some choices. Plan B is also the real budget because if a budget resolution has not be compl been completed by April the 15th, and one never has been before, Section 603 of the Budget Enforcement Act requires that a Section 602 allocation be made based on the discretionary limits, that is, the defense, international, and domestic uh, discretionary caps contained in the President's most recent budget submission. That's the law. Because domestic discretionary spending in Plan A exceeds the current law, um, the uh, law does not permit an allocation to be made based on Plan A unless a budget resolution has been completed by that time. I would strongly urge you not to permit any amendments to the budget resolution which would circumvent the current law and lead to sequestration. That would be the worst possible outcome, I think, for us all. The three critical issues that confront Congress this year, and the budget resolution presented by our chairman avoids all three of them, defense and the proper level for defense spending, revenues and the place of a tax cut or no tax cut, and what to do about curbing runaway entitlement growth. The two-plan approach was adopted. Let's be candid about what happened. It was adopted when it became clear that the Budget Committee majority didn't have enough votes to insist on Plan A standing alone. They would have lost that vote in the Budget Committee. And they were unwilling to develop a resolution which would require support, God forbid, of Republicans, a bipartisan uh, approach, which would have stayed within the Budget Enforcement Act firewalls. So the only thing they could do was to bring two conflicting pieces in here and claim victory. Only by setting up a plan to satisfy each of the two conflicting factions within the guise of a single budget resolution could the necessary votes be garnered. That's what happened in the Budget Committee. Even with two budget resolutions in one, Mr. Chairman, the committee majority found it impossible to agree on a defense plan. First of all, rescissions of the 1992 defense appropriations, whether along the lines proposed by the President or according to a congressional plan, were rejected. We offered the 1992 rescission, not insisting upon the exact composition, but at least the total number, and the committee would not even agree with that. It is impossible, according to everyone that we've talked to, to achieve the President's defense cuts by 1997 unless reductions are begun this year, the current fiscal year, 1992. There is absolutely no likelihood that the deeper cuts advocated by the majority can be achieved without 1992 rescissions. And yet when we offered them, they were rejected by the Budget Committee. 
Second, the committee was unable to agree on defense cuts for the years after 1993, or to choose one of the four paths described by Chairman Aspen. Instead of providing this guidance, which I've always thought was one of the purposes of the Budget Committee, they inserted baseline defense levels into their budget resolution for the years after 1993. This has resulted in the absolutely unbelievable, absurd result that the majority's five-year defense budget authority exceeds that proposed by the president by $29 billion. They say they're cutting, but because they couldn't agree what the numbers should be, except for year one, they end up with a higher number by $29 billion than the president. Budget resolution is supposed to be a plan for spending. This concurrent resolution contains not one but two plans, neither of which suggests where defense spending should be heading either in 1992 or from 1994 on. The only year it seems to be able to agree on is 1993. I am struck also that the Budget Committee ducked the revenue issue. The committee markup was held in the Budget Committee the very day the House voted to pass the majority's tax bill, H.R. 4287. Yet this tax bill is not represented in the revenue levels contained in the budget resolution. Instead, the resolution resorts to the baseline level. It doesn't even incorporate the tax bill that the majority wanted. Very odd resolution. Finally, Mr. Chairman, the committee sidestepped the difficult issue of dealing with entitlement growth. We offered a number of amendments along those lines, all of which were rejected. When offered with um, the repeated opportunities during markup to restrain, restrain entitlement growth, the committee turned it down for the second year in a row. I would acknowledge that sometime between the end of markup late last Thursday night and the filing of the official report, the majority included an unspecified $2 billion entitlement cut, for which I would say better late than never, but we had no discussion of that in committee, and I, for one, haven't the foggiest idea what it represents. Uh, maybe it was that they were listening to us, but just didn't want to vote for it and break the solidarity uh, which was involved in bringing uh, to the House uh, this uh, document. Let me just conclude, Mr. Chairman, by saying this, that I always thought that the, that the purpose of a budget resolution was to present to the, co to the House recommendations for a budget. Let me stress the word a budget, not two conflicting budgets. Regrettably, what is being presented to the House is not a budget resolution, but what I would call a non-budget, non-resolution. It, it, uh, it makes the whole budget process meaningless, and uh, I guess it exposes the fact that the Emperor has no clothes, and also that your majority on the Budget Committee couldn't agree uh, with what ought to be presented to the House. Well, do you think that the Budget Process Reform Act uh, uh, from John Connors Committee that uh, specifically addresses the take, tearing down the firewalls uh, makes the budget uh, process more palatable? No, I don't. I, I think that the co Congress knew what it was doing when it, less than a year and a half ago, passed the Budget Enforcement Act, which set ceilings for each of these three areas, including defense, for fiscal 93, but didn't set floors. What the, what the Budget Enforcement Act said with regard to defense is, if you spend less than the ceiling, it's to be used for deficit reduction. I think that's a pretty good idea. And I, I would have to point out to you um, that the votes that passed that act, in frankness, came largely, not entirely, but largely from your side of the aisle. And it kind of surprises me to see a repudiation of a basic principle of that act, which was meant to last for five years and has only been on the books for, uh, for about a year and a half. All right, I'll come back to you. I understand Mr. Ginger which has got a very important meeting. Well, uh, we, we are both of us uh, joining Mr. Solomon and missing the leadership meeting. And uh, since it's the day after Mr. Michael's birthday, I'm not sure we should mm. keep waiting for it. But I appreciate very much the chance to be here, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let, me, let me first of all say I, I want to take at least 10 seconds and praise Bill Gratison, who I think has been an extraordinarily effective Republican leader in the committee. And I want to praise the President's budget, which we are delighted that I think you will make an order and we look forward to having a chance to vote on it. Um, Director Darman worked very closely with uh, House Republicans and in particular with the task force of uh, John Kasich and Tom DeLay and John Miller and Rick Santorum. And I think that as a result, we have some very good things in there I feel very comfortable in voting for. 
I, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, you face a very simple but very real test of the House Democratic leadership's seriousness. I uh, couldn't help but notice, you know, we live in revolutionary times. The, the Wall Street Journal this morning made the point that the UN yesterday admitted eight newly independent former Soviet republics. We live in a time of tremendous change. And, and this particular appeal to you on the Rules Committee, I think, is a perfect example of what the country is worried about and why I occasionally refer to myself as a revolutionary in terms of change. You have a country which is desperate for leadership and for choice. I watched uh, three of your party's debates over the weekend uh, on C-SPAN. And, and you heard references about Santa Claus and about lollipops and about the need to be honest and the need to tell the truth. And yet here we are debating the concept of a budget resolution or a schizophrenic dual opportunity in which everybody can vote for, for both budgets inside the Democratic House leadership package. You can go back home to Massachusetts and say you really did include Patriot missiles. You can go back home to California and say you really did include defense spending. And if you're on the left, you can go back home and say, no, you killed them. And you get both results with the same vote. And I think it's just, frankly, hopelessly irresponsible for the Budget Committee to come to you and ask you to make in, 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 uh, in order a no-choice budget which allows everybody to be all things to all people. Now, I, I just have two very specific suggestions. One is schedule the Conyers bill first. If it fails, and I believe it, it will fail, and I think your leadership will tell you it'll fail, and I think your WIP organization will tell you it'll fail. If it fails, you know you don't need one of the two budgets that are wrapped up in the budget resolution, because it's dead. And then you've got to decide whether or not you can pass the budget resolutions there. Or if, in fact, you're not willing to schedule Conyers first and his bill, which is what would legally be necessary because it would require, in fact, the president agreeing to take down the walls, because they're locked into law. They're not House resolutions. And there's no hope you could override his veto of the Conyers bill. If that doesn't pass, then it seems to me you have to come with, with B. But if, if, in fact, you don't want to bring up Conyers first, I would suggest you simply break out the two Democratic budgets into A and B and give us, give us a choice. And, and we'll be willing, on a bipartisan basis, to work with all of you. We'll be willing to, to try to shape a vote. The House will work its will. And either A or Bill B will succeed. I'm saying this in the sad presumption that on partisan grounds, the President's budget, which I think is better, will not pass. But, but assuming for a minute that the President's budget can't pass, even though I wish it could, we'd be willing to work with you on a choice of A or B and see which one wins. And then that becomes the budget resolutions guidance for the Appropriations Committee. But I think to, to have the House shirk its responsibility, avoid all choice, and pass a schizophrenic resolution that's internal, inherently self-contradictory, I think is exactly what the country is now rebelling against. So I appreciate very much the chance to come and to be with you. Very nice to have you here. You can be excused, Mr. Gingrich, if you want to go now. Unless anybody's good. Well, we I, I wouldn't want to drive my Oh, I'm sorry. Really like I, will oh. Reserve my right. <laughs> I will reserve my right If we thought... Question. We thought his questions would be as tough on you as they have been on the other side. I wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate a minute. If I thought his questions would be as tough on me as they were on the other side, I'd talk to him a great deal outside this room. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much, and I appreciate it. Any questions on the side of the schedules? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's the, oh. getting back to... Uh, I can't leave. <laughs> Getting back to what we're talking about, yes. Uh, do you feel the same way that uh, Mr. Gingrich says that the the uh, Conyers bill, if at all, should come up before the the budget bill? Yes, or there should be an opportunity to choose between A and B. We did offer a motion to separate uh, in the committee, and the majority defeated it. Then we offered a, a proposal for just a language change, which would at least give the House guidance from the budget committee members as to which version they preferred, and they didn't want to vote on that either. So, you know, it's pretty obvious that uh, your side uh, uh, doesn't want to have the House make those choices, but I, you know, I do regret that because I, I think that, uh, I, I think that's a fundamental issue in budgeting, which way are we going to go? So I think that a motion to, uh, probably the easiest way to do it now, and it wouldn't take a lengthy debate, uh, would be to permit a motion to uh, strike one or the other, uh, which would then pose the issue. Probably a motion to strike A would be the one that uh, make the most sense from our point of view. <coughs> well, the, the, the choice 
would have to be made in the kindness bill. Well, that's, uh, that's true in terms of legislation. Let's face it, the Conyers bill isn't going anywhere. It, uh, uh, and it, 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 we don't, you, it, the votes aren't going to be there to override a veto, and we've already been told it's going to veto. So it's, it's just a chance for people to, say, to go back home and say they were for spending more money. I, I don't mind that. I'd rather go home and I've done this and said I'm for uh, uh, using any defense savings to reduce the deficit. And so, by the way, has my colleague in the other part of Cincinnati, who happens to be a member of your party, not mine, saying exactly the same thing. Uh, in Cincinnati, both members from two parties are saying the same thing. Uh, I think you're handing us an issue, but I just don't think it's the way, which I like to have, to be honest with you, but I th don't think it's the way we ought to see the House of Representatives make, or more to the point, avoid making a decision. Um, the gentle lady from New York was saying, well, we want to go back home and tell people we're you know, looking out for their interests. I, I don't concede that we're looking out for our interests the interest of our constituents by going home and telling them we figured out a way to spend more money and borrow more. I, I, I missed that one. Well, I, but be, just before you missed that, she was talking about putting people back to work and starting up uh, new employment centers and uh, taking care of homeless and, and, and some of the domestic needs that have been uh, cut out, part of the 25 percent of the domestic programs that have been cut out uh, during the 80s. I. Uh, Maybe I've been an economist longer than I've been a congressman, but uh, I find it a serious worry that the talk around here last week about borrowing an extra $30 billion to pay for a tax cut, and this week to borrow an extra 7 to $10 billion to support Conyers, I find it a worry because I see long-term interest rates going up, and they are going up. I hope they don't stay up. But I, the, the notion that we can talk about these things and they have no consequences of, uh, in the real world, the real economic world, I don't think is true. Now, in my area, we're starting, thank goodness, finally to see some resurgence in home building. I hope it reaches the whole country soon. But it's sure going to get choked off if the credit markets get the idea uh, that we're not satisfied to just pump a billion dollars a day in deficit borrowing back into the economy. If that isn't enough for all the good things we want to do for our people, where's the limit, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Solomon. Bill, the truth of the matter is, interest rates are going up because the government becomes more competitive with the private sector in borrowing money. And any time you've got people competing for money, it dry, and there's a shortage of money, it drives up the interest rates. You know, in all my years in this Congress, I have never seen a cop-out like this because that's exactly what this A and B plan does. It lets people vote both ways. First of all, it says, I want to, I'm voting to put all this money into all your favorite programs. But if this doesn't happen and that doesn't happen, then I voted to really hold the line and stay within these caps. What a bunch of baloney. That's why, you know, your suggestion, which I was advocating here earlier, uh, to have a vote on the floor to separate A and B and make these members of Congress stand up and be counted. But this Rules Committee is not going to do that today. They're going to play this same old game, and we're going to go to the floor, and we're going to hide our votes from the American people. And that's a shame. We ought to be doing what you're asking for. And I yield back the balance I, of my time. I, we're not going to hide our votes. I'm sure there won't be one of these votes that come out of the Rules Committee. There won't be roll call. I'm not talking about here. I'm talking about on the floor. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No. Okay. Mr. Derek. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're not going to hide them on the floor either. That's, uh, Mr. Sullivan knows that's not true as well as I do. Uh, Mr. Gattison, Gattison, let me, uh, you know, I have a, a tremendous amount of respect for you, and, and you know that, and we've been friends and worked together on the Budget Committee for 18 years, I guess, for a long time, and I really do. You know, I, uh, I, I agree with you uh, about the deficit and the fact that we need to bring it down, but, you know, we also... And, and I've said this several times today, and I apologize to my colleagues for repeating it, but you know, I, as I see uh, part of our problem over the last number of years is that we were devoting a substantial part of, 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 of our gross national product to our defense needs, and it was needed. And, and you know, I supported most of it, and most of us did, as we should have, and, and it was a, a very productive in that it has brought down the the uh, Soviet Empire and so forth and so on. But the fact of the matter is that I think, as we all know, that money that is spent in the defense area 
as far as the economy is concerned, does not produce as many jobs uh, as, many, as, as money that's put into the private uh, sector. Figures that I have, I have no reason to think that they're wrong, indicate that uh, probably uh, for every billion dollars of the defense budget uh, that is put into the private uh, economy, uh, you've created uh, another 10,000 additional jobs that wouldn't have been created had it uh, gone into the defense thing. And it, it seems to me that uh, whether we do it through a budget reduction or, or whether we uh, or how we do it, that, that that is really what we need to do because, you know, uh, I agree with you. You know, this, this body, the House, as well as it administrations, Democrat and Republican, have made mistakes as we sit here on a Saturday morning and quarterback. But the fact of the matter is we are where we are. And what we're going to have to do is to put our people back to work as best we can. And it seems to me that we need to take as much. I don't want to put the uh, the country in jeopardy, and, and I don't think any, any member of this Congress does. And, and then that becomes a matter of judgment about where the jeopardy uh, uh, figure lies. But it seems to me that, you know, as we've won uh, two major world wars and uh, a number of wars that weren't major world wars during this uh, century, our men and women have, 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 have fought hard and they've been great uh, military people and all that. But the fact of the matter is that we were able, because we had the strongest economy in the world, to provide them with what they needed uh, to do the job. And we did that through the private sector and having, and, and the fact is that we didn't for a long time put as much uh, of our uh, gross national product in defense uh, as we have uh, in, in the last few years. And it's when we were really building that, that base. And it just seems to me that we need to put as much of that money back in to create these jobs as possible. Well, I would not argue for spending a dime more than we need for defense. That is not my argument. The question is, to the extent that defense is cut, what should be done with the proceeds? Right. And I'm arguing that the economy would be better served to let the private economy make that decision. If it's a billion dollars that we cut and we use it for deficit reduction, there is a billion dollars more out there in the private economy that is available for people to borrow, to expand businesses, uh, to build homes, uh, to build inventories, to pay for college loans and all the other things. So there's not an unlimited amount of dough out there and uh, the notion that only the federal government and its mysterious wisdom can sensibly decide how to use these monies to create jobs is I guess really where we may have some disagreement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Of course, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And <clears throat> Bill, I want to congratulate you on your fine work that you've done over the years on this committee. Uh, I didn't think I'd find myself saying this, but Mr. Solomon is wrong and Mr. Derrick is right. I and my position. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's exactly what I was afraid of. The issue I'm discussing is this question of hiding our votes on the floor. We're not going to hide our votes on the floor, but the way this thing is structured, we're going to be hiding the truth from the American people. Why? Because this package, with A and B and the option and looking at Conyers and all of the multifarious uh, options that are here, provide us with the opportunity to be all things to all people. And I think that's the, the really uh, unfortunate thing about the way this process is being considered. Would you concur with that as far as the direction that we're taking this, Bill? Well, yeah, I, I always uh, thought that budgeting was making choices. Uh, this budget, is, uh, as it's brought uh, to your committee, is one of avoiding making a choice. And, it, and frankly, it, it will permit those members who wish to do so, as their chairman did just a little while ago, to give you a long laundry list of all these wonderful sounding things that would be done, but knowing that that can't happen mm -hmm. under the Bo Budget Enforcement mm -hmm. Act which, among others, he voted for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Yeah. Uh, he did, and now he's trying to walk away from it. This is one he's of the not alone in trying to do that. Yeah, this is one of the most frustrating things, Bill, that I've, I've seen over the years, is that, that we have people who will so often in their districts talk the line of fiscal responsibility and balancing the budget and tax responsibility with reduction, these sorts of things, and then here in the Congress, they have the, uh, the, the chance to cast votes which are anathema to what it is that they've said. And often people don't check it. Well, now 
they've got the option to say whatever they want and point to whatever they want as their record and in fact obfuscate some of the other things when, as you say, uh, really tough choices aren't going to be made here. And I, I, I'm glad that you're, you tried to do it in the Budget Committee and you're trying to do it again here and we'll try to do it again when we get to the floor. Uh, I'm not terribly sanguine about our chances for success, but we're going to continue to try and I thank you for trying. Yeah, keep the faith, my friend. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I, I first want to say, it's been said before, but it, it needs to repeating, that, that Bill Gratison is as fair, as thoughtful, and decent a, as a colleague as we have around this place. And it's a, it's a pleasure for all of us on the Democratic side, as I'm sure it is, members on the Republican side, to have him as the ranking Republican member on the, on the Budget Committee. And I understand he's, he's being very decent, circumspect in his, in his statements here today. And we understand where he's coming from, and, and to a certain extent he has He's right about some things, perhaps not about others, but we appreciate the fact that he's taking the position the way he has. I don't mean to debate this, Bill, but, but your, your, your sidekick over there, your, your colleague, Mr. Gingrich, before he left, said, and I, I quote him, that we live in times of tremendous change. We discussed that at some length this morning, especially Mr. Derrick and I. It's true that we're proposing to change, in a, and I think in a relatively modest way, the budget agreement of last year. I think it's also fair to say that things have changed enormously in the world and here at home in the past 16, 18 months. And were we to have that budget agreement or proposed budget agreement before us this year, we probably would have adopted it, if at all, in some somewhat different, different way. Probably would have allowed, provided for some changeover of, of defense spending, some modest amounts is being proposed and as is being proposed or would be proposed by Plan A into, into domestic spending because it's another year and a quarter or a year and a half into the recession. People back home are hurting more than they did just a year and a half ago, are demanding more attention, quite properly so. So all I'm saying is that, you know, nothing is, is in concrete. There's, we'd be irresponsible as we the two of us suggested this morning, if we, if we didn't take notice of the, of the changes in the situation at home and, and abroad and, and uh, suggest this very, what I believe to be a really quite a modest change in the, in the budget agreement. Overall, it still works. Overall, over a five-year period, it is and will continue to reduce our deficits over that five-year period by close to a half a trillion dollars, and that part remains in place. So it's not tragic if, in fact, we end up changing it, in my opinion. Much of the discussion about changes in the world since the Budget Enforcement Act of 1990 was written a year, about a year and a half ago, uh, properly focused on what's happened in Eastern Europe and what has happened to the threat uh, to which we will, must respond in one way or the other uh, in defense. But that's not the whole story. The Budget Enforcement Act anticipated a substantial reduction in the deficit when it's gone just the other way. Instead of going down, it's going up. But that's not, but that's not and, the, and, that's and, not and the and BA's fault. I'm not saying it is. No, I I'm just saying nor, you know, Eastern Europe had no connection no. to the Budget Enforcement Act either. But what I'm suggest, going to suggest is that while I'm sure that lots of things happened since that act was passed that weren't contemplated then, uh, one of the items that would be on a comprehensive list of, of unexpected changes, I would say, is the explosive growth of the national debt and, and of the annual deficit. And so I do not think it unreasonable to suggest that if we can achieve additional savings in defense uh, below the levels anticipated a year and a half ago that should be used for deficit reduction. Uh, but, that, but we're past that. I mean, basically, we're all, you're the Rules Committee. All we're, we're asking you to do is let the House vote on this and decide which of two budget resolutions it wants instead of approving a resolution which makes no choices. I mean, that's all we're really asking. And, and I'm not arguing that you should support my viewpoint ab about retaining the, the firewalls, but I, I don't think it unreasonable for us to ask that the House be able to make that choice instead of being, able, being denied that choice. Well, let me, I didn't mean to, I didn't want to get in here, you know, debate this politically. We've been doing that all day long. There's not an awful lot of usefulness in that. Uh, it's not unreasonable for us to be concerned even more about the budget deficit now than it was last year at the time the BEA was adopted. Uh, and I, I say this very nicely, but I'm not, off, I'm not awfully impressed by the three or four or five folks who've said, made that comment here today, but voted last week for, for tax bills, which in my opinion, the opinion of CBO, would have increased the size of the deficit over the next few years. So I take that with a bit of grain of salt. The choice that's before us at the moment, really, and as you know, as the gentleman knows, this gentleman cares a great deal about the budget deficit and has and has voted quite fiscally conservatively for a good many years now. We're, we're faced with a choice of, of, of perhaps adding about six or seven billion dollars to a 400 billion dollar deficit. 
it, unfortunately, the deficit is so huge that at the same time it makes you feel like, you know, what difference does six or seven billion make? Whereas the, which it does and it doesn't. I mean, I understand it's a tiny fraction of the budget deficit, but it does add that much more to it, I quite concede. At the same time, it's also fair to point out that a six billion dollar infusion of monies or new monies or additional monies into existing very valuable domestic discretionary programs which have been badly underfunded for the past decade or so can make a lot of difference with respect to those programs. They've been hurt. They've been decimated ever since 1981. So that's, in a sense, the, the choice that we have to make. And finally, let me just say this, and again, I don't mean to be argumentative, but I don't really agree that Mr. Conyers' bill won't go anywhere. Uh, perhaps it won't at the outset, but I suspect that, that Plan A, budget, the budget, budget resolution, or something similar to it, will end up being our budget resolution uh, by the, by the end of the year. Uh, Conyers, in some form, may yet become law. The president may yet change his mind. You know, instead of listening to Pat Buchanan, he may start listening to the majority of the Americans back home, who frankly, in my opinion, having been back home a lot this year, having a very difficult competitive di new district to run in, uh, people back home, in fact, want to do the kinds of things that Chairman Panetta pointed out to us just a little while ago are provided for uh, by the programs which are funded to a greater extent by plan A than by plan B. They want the jobs, they want the health care, they want the education and the job training. And that's the choice we all have to make. So it's, uh, it's not an irresponsible choice. I think it's a very useful choice which the Budget Committee has presented to us. And uh, I think we'll give members on the floor in the next couple of weeks an opportunity to make that choice and to, and to be able to go back home and say, yes, I did, you know, I, I did make that choice and, and I, because I, I thought we ought to spend overall another six or seven billion dollars in these, in these areas of, of needs that have been unmet to a great enough extent over the past decade or more. Well, if I may uh, conclude, I'd like to call to your attention uh, a section in the minority views which uh, the Republicans on the Budget Committee have presented with regard to the levels of domestic discretionary spending and the very the bottom line of it all is that there has been a substantial real increase in domestic discretionary spending. The notion that these programs have been decimated, while it makes great rhetoric, is not borne out uh, by, the, uh, by the facts. Over the past decade? Yes. Uh, let me, for example, that's uh, the only, I have the, the domestic discretionary programs are the only portion of the, of the budget that's, that has been de that It's has been decreased declining as a percentage of gross national product. But for example, and I just happen to have these figures in front of me, we'd be glad to submit additional uh, numbers for your uh, review. Um, the, uh, the budget authority increases 1986 to 1993. Uh, thirty-three percent real uh, increase outlays domestic discretionary nineteen percent real increase from nineteen eighty-six to nineteen ninety-three. Those, those, I, I can give you other numbers if you like. Uh, that's not exactly savaging these programs. Uh, not, you know, where, where, when is it ever enough? Well, no, I don't mean to prolong the argument. He's a nice gentleman and a good friend of mine. And, and as I said, you know, there are a lot of politics involved here today. I understand that. Uh, and as I suggested earlier, when you go back home, as representatives of the people back home, it's clear where their priorities are. And their priorities at this moment, at least to a modest extent, are to put some modest additional amounts of money into some of these programs which will provide them with jobs and some hope for a decent economic future. Not to throw it away on so-called middle class tax cuts as uh, some of us, uh, some of our colleagues on both sides proposed last week, and not to reduce a $400 billion deficit next year by six or seven billion dollars when that money could be more usefully and better spent right now, at least, uh, in terms of providing jobs and some hope for people back home. Well, I don't want to belabor this any more than the, the distinguished gentleman from California does, but six or seven billion dollars more spent and borrowed and then spent by us is six or seven billion dollars less available for people to borrow, to expand their businesses and to buy homes and to do other uh, good things. I just think it, it, it I understand, this is a generalization. I, people would rather make those decisions on their own about what to do with their money than have us do it for them. I'm trying to be gentle with a gentleman who voted last week for a tax bill which CBO says will cost us $25 billion in additional deficit over the next five years. Uh, the, uh, I realize the gentleman voted against yours and, and ours. Both of them, but the uh, gentleman's party supported a bill which would have involved borrowing $30 billion just in the next two years to finance what is said to be a temporary tax cut. I 
this gentleman, when I this gentleman it, I know you didn't. pointed I know it you, out on the floor. In I fact, know you didn't. In fact, the tr truth of the matter is the Democratic bill would have cost $300 billion in additional deficits over the next 20 years because of the index capital gains provision, and $75 billion additional <laughs> in deficits over the, in the third, fourth, and fifth year if we, uh, if we did not uh, if we, if we did not let lapse the middle class tax cuts two years from now in the middle of an election year, which we probably wouldn't do. So it probably would have cost us $375 billion in additional deficits, well, as, would, as would your bill with respect to its capital gains cuts, too. I know you're giving me advice. I'm going to give you no, some, too. No, no, I'm too, just saying. Which is that I think, I think that, the, the, that if, if you want to carry into this week the principles which you applied last week, you'd at least allow the House to have a, uh, have a choice as to, in budget, voting on the budget resolution, whether it wants to borrow this other six or seven or eight billion dollars, or it doesn't. Right. All I would say is my colleague from Ohio, how much, uh, as other, everyone else who has asked questions, that uh, we appreciate your service so diligently and so capably in such an important position on the Budget Committee. Our only prayer is that you're increasingly successful in the days ahead. Thank you very much. I, I thank the gentleman from the adjoining district. <laughs> Mr. Gordon, uh, I failed to make as part of my opening uh, remark uh, my admiration for your work that you do in the Congress. So I, don't, I don't want to be said that I'm the only one that doesn't, don't appreciate it. <laughs> It, it goes both ways. Uh, I, I enjoy these visits, and one of the truly one of the satisfactions of my job as ranking member is the opportunity to visit with the rules committee from time to time and discuss these issues. It's wonderful preparation for going to the floor, Mr. Chairman. Jim Moore must give you a lot of this financial information. He's been doing it since the middle 1940s. Thank you very much. The Honorable Charles Spencer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank the committee as well. I'll be brief. I have an amendment which is uh, very simple and very easy to understand, which is the direction of having a what I believe to be our needs in the national defense. It, it reads as follows. The amount of funds allocated to the national defense function, 050, in this resolution shall be the amount contained in the President's budget that was submitted to Congress. In order to achieve the objective of retaining the President's national defense budget figure, the budget figures for all other government uh, functions shall be reduced. Mr. Chairman, um, I was eight years old when the World War I stopped, and I remember in the decade or two that followed that, uh, a movement throughout the United States to relatively become disarmed. As a matter of fact, I probably deserve some discredit because as a college editor at the University of Florida, I was uh, firmly opposed to compulsory ROTC and uh, like a lot of people of that era, felt like there would never be another war because uh, President Wilson announced it wouldn't. And then we got into World War II and uh, I, like many others, en enlisted uh, in the infantry and uh, had an experience of about five years of that. And my uh, feeling about this is that uh, it's a safer and better procedure to follow the budget which has been handed to us by uh, thoughtful people who've dedicated their lives to arriving at the proper structure for defense of our country. Now, if we had had in our Armed Services Committee hearings which uh, discussed in detail what was expected to be as a substitute for the base force, uh, and we had any votes on the matter, uh, I would be a little more content with uh, the bill which is probably uh, going to be the major bill before you. Uh, but actually, we took no votes on those matters. We did have discussion. We discussed the president's, I mean, not the president, but the chairman's speeches, and we discussed these four levels of possibility of uh, financing. All of them are based on the fundamental idea that there was something magic about the Desert Storm War. The Desert Storm War is never going to be repeated in history in, in a realistic fashion because it's not an ordinary war. Uh, I'm primarily responsible in the field of the Navy, and uh, the Navy never received a round. Uh, every 50 miles, there was a merchant ship taking stuff to the best docks in the world. 
uh, uh, which Saudi Arabia had built. Uh, the uh, uh, Saudi Arabians acted like cowards. They stayed in their, in their holes. The leader was a fanatical uh, man of uh, no mental capacity to carry on any leadership. Uh, it, it's not a war that's a, that's a pattern for future wars, a very, very unusual war. Congress deserves credit for giving the military strength that it gave to our country in the years that went before. So we had the equipment, we had uh, dedicated and fine soldiers and airmen and Navy personnel. But uh, to feel that something like that could not happen in the future, uh, to omit the history that we have in our world of how leaders are developed and how countries have problems uh, would be a great mistake in my opinion. When you look at Japan, for instance, what did Japan do in World War II? Uh, Japan uh, decided that it had a very piece of, small piece of territory for its country and decided that it needed to expand, that we had to have, they had to have people help them. And so they worked their way down to Indonesia. Our country stood in their way and they finally, we went to war about it. There's nothing that's changed in that. If anything, it's worse with regard to Japan than it was then. How about the leadership of China? Leadership of China and the man in the mind is in the hands of people uh, who nobody could uh, prognosticate about as to what they might do. Uh, they might have designs on the Philippines. Uh, anything like this could occur. So we so we have a, a situation which is fraught with many difficulties, and I th I think it's the wise and prudent thing to do uh, to uh, adhere to the president's budget uh, with regard to defense. And that's all I have to say. I'd like to have the opportunity to offer this on the floor, because I think that those of us who experience war and those of us who want to try to keep our country strong uh, would like to have a chance to see that uh, strength that we would need in the future is available. Thank you very much. Your figures raise the president's military figures. Sir? Your figures raise the president's... Raise it to the president. Figure. It doesn't raise the president figure. It, 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 it just puts the president's figure as the thing that ought to pass. Oh, I see. And, it, well, yeah. And it, doesn't make a, it doesn't make a more drastic I see, cut. I see. Uh, other bud budget functions should be reduced to arrive at the president's figure. To arrive at the, my amendment, is, it just simply says that the president's figure shall be the figure we will have, and that to arrive at that with regard to assets, that the other parts of the budget uh, pr procurement would be uh, lessened. But it doesn't, doesn't decrease the president's uh, request. You don't specify how the reductions will be made. Well, I could have done that, but the thing about it is it's a hard enough job to do this budget thing as it is, and I thought it ought to be left up to the committee to do. I've got my own ideas where it could come from, but I, but I, I didn't want to put it in this amendment because I thought that they ought to have the maximum flexibility. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and let me uh, congratulate my good friend Charlie Bennett for uh, another one of his uh, great uh, amendments. I've been privileged to join with him in co-sponsoring amendments on transportation and other things in the past, and I think this it's is a very a important one. Tom Ridge, incidentally, is joining with me on this one. Good. Well, I'm happy to support you on it. I think it's a very good amendment, and frankly, you provided an extraordinarily eloquent statement as to the case that we make as it relates to the preamble of the Constitution, quoting President Wilson, uh, when you were eight years old, <clears throat> I think gets right to the point where we are today. As we listen to the debate here in this committee this morning, we spent a great deal of time talking about national security, as is always the case when Jerry Solomon is around. Uh, we we uh, see that we cannot blindly look off into the future and know exactly what is going to happen. And I was, we, we were quoting uh, President Bush's State of the Union message in which he said the Cold War is over, but he also said in that State of the Union message, only the dead have seen the end of conflict. And uh, it's a tragic statement, one that I don't like, and he doesn't like it, but it is a, it is a fact of life. As we look at 
those priorities. You said that you have some ideas as to where those cuts might take place if we are, in fact, to put in the President's um, $50 billion cut and no further. Uh, what, what would those ideas be, Mr. Bennett? Well, I guess one that would uh, this is not involve my amendment, because it's that the right. committee. But I would say the most wasteful money that we're spending today is the excessive amount of money we're spending on SDI. I think we're spending uh, at least a billion dollars too much a, a year on it. Mm -hmm. I think it should not go higher than three billion. Now, mm -hmm. the sub could change this. If, if the uh, people who have ICBM would agree with us to reduce the numbers, say, to a thousand, that's a thousand Hiroshima's, mm -hmm. uh, then SDI might really start making some sense. Mm -hmm. But when, as long as you've got 10,000 or more around, uh, nobody really thinks you can answer it with an SDI. Well, if you know in that in that State of the Union message of the President, he actually added his line as we sat there and read his text. You remember he added in the SDI commitment yes, I know that, that. that he that he uh, so made I there. And with I with every military yeah. thing he asked. For. No, I, I the, the point I'm making is that I think he wanted to underscore that with 15 nations that either have or are on the verge of having nuclear war making capability. And well, another thing, the President said he was willing to cut out 146 agencies of the federal government. I wrote him a letter and told him he send me the list and I'll introduce it because mm -hmm. I think there are that many. I think it was about 246 actually I think. Well anyway he said 146 and I'm yeah. waiting for the list. I think I'll get it and I'll, I plan to introduce that list. Well, maybe we'll have some amendments we can co-sponsor again then. Thank you very much Thank Mr. You. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bennett, I, too, want to thank you for your testimony and your excellent analysis. It's absolutely correct. Every generation feels that uh, what they've done is better than anyone else has ever done, and they've solved the problem and made the world safe for democracy or the war to end all wars or whatever the case may be. But uh, as General Colin Powell says so well, when he stepped into that job as chairman of the Joint Chiefs, he said there were 12 crises that he's faced, beginning with Panama, and he said, I have no doubt in my mind that the 13th is hanging out there someplace. And uh, it is absolutely foolish for us to have studied history to think that somehow or another man is going to allow peace and prosperity to prevail unabated and unchallenged. And uh, lest we go through the, through the cycle of having to find ourselves vulnerable and then start up again, your analysis of history and your personal commitment to it is very, very welcome here today, and I thank you for it. Thank you very much. We'll now hear from the panel of the Honorable Dolphus Towns, Ronald Dellums, Nancy Pelosi, Maybe we should change places. <laughs> <laughs> Chairman Towns, we're happy to have you here representing the Congressional Black Caucus and the Progressive Caucus, and we would be pleased to receive your statement at this time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wheat and uh, members of the Rules Committee. It is my pleasure as Chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus to appear before you to request that the CBC FY93 alternative be made in order as an amendment in the nature of a substitute for the House Budget Committee resolution. This is a budget for new world realities and for rebuilding America which is offered in coalition with the House Progressive Caucus. We come before you today to address both process and substance. We can no longer afford to conduct business as usual with an abbreviated, truncated, discussion on issues so crucial to the health and well-being of this nation. We therefore request 
that this committee allow the debate of both the House budget resolution and this alternative to extend over a full legislative workday to enable sufficient exploration of the policies and programs reflected in these proposals. It is our belief that we have provided for this nation a new vision of fiscal priority. Indeed, Mr. Chairman, this is the people's alternative, which establishes as a foundation our responsibility to restore a stable economic environment and quality of life for all Americans. We are here today because we are committed to leadership, not followership. I bring to you a panel which represents the broad cross-section of views which are embodied in our alternative. I recognize first the chief architect of the FY93 CBC alternative a gentleman of visionary leadership who leads this nation to the moral high ground on questions of principle and integrity. I also would like to take this opportunity to thank this gentleman from Oakland, California, California by the name of Ron Dellums, who has worked day and night, him and his staff, to make certain that this budget is in order. He has done a fantastic job. Also joining me here is Maxine Waters, who's been a champion for the less fortunate for many, many years. Is also with us and a member of the Congressional Black Caucus. And following Maxine, we have distinguished gentlelady from California, Nancy Pelosi, and a lifelong champion for justice and the independent political process. And also, we have the distinguished gentleman from Vermont, Congressman Bernie Sanders, who has said that our priorities are upside down. I would like to now stop and introduce the gentleman who really has worked day and night to bring us to this point in time, the Honorable Ronald Dellums. Chairman Dellums and all of the members of the panel, we're happy to have you with us today, and we're happy to receive any written testimony that you'd like to provide. And if you want to uh, give a, an oral statement uh, at this time, we'd appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. It's always good to appear before you. And first, let me thank my colleague for his uh, very generous uh, remarks and his opening statement. And begin by saying to, to you and members of this committee that in this gentleman's humble opinion, this is not a political moment. It is not a partisan moment. It is a historical moment. But I'm not naive enough to uh, believe that politics and partisanship will not rear its head as these debates go forward. But I'm simply trying to underscore the significance of this moment. This is historical. If I had said, for example, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee just a few short months ago, that the hammer and sickle will not fly over the Kremlin, that it will be replaced by a red, white, and blue flag. If I said to all of you just a few short months ago that the Soviet Union as we know it would no longer exist, and that if I were to say to you that a non-communist would be the, the president of, of uh, Russia, then all of you would have said the 8th District in California elected Ron Dellums one term too many, the brothers now certifiably mentally disturbed. <laughs> But the fact of the matter is that we have come together here against the backdrop of those realities. The world has indeed changed, changed in extraordinary and incredible ways, ways that have uh, impact uh, beyond our capacity to fully envision at this moment. On the other side of that, in this country, there is extraordinary economic and social dislocation, tremendous pain and human misery that's reflected in many ways. What we're asking you to do is to not only place the Congressional Black Caucus slash Progressive Caucus's budget before the House of Representatives to be debated, we believe that the entire budget process should be dignified. We spent three and a half days, Mr. Chairman, uh, on Graham Rudman. This is a much more significant moment, and the step that we take over the next few days will mark the direction of this country into the next decade. So this is a, an incredible moment. I think a moment that this Congress and the American people should stop, pause, and to reflect in very substantive and powerful ways 
on where we ought to go. We have worked three and a half months, literally, every day to come to terms with this issue. We had a four-point program. We said first, let's get ourselves out of the straitjacket of the 1990 budget agreement that has us now hamstrung. World events and events in this nation are unfolding in such incredible ways that it renders that budget agreement uh, null and void. At a minimum, we ought to bring down the walls. And that will be a, a subject of discussion and debate in, at some point in the next several days in the Congress. One item in our proposal was to come together, to bring together a tax equity package to literally take from the wealthy that have benefited from the uh, uh, tax relief uh, and deregulation of the Congress and return it to the American people, the working class and middle class people in this country in a revenue neutral fashion. But events have overtaken us in that regard. The Congress has acted. What then are the remaining two points of our program? Number one, that against the backdrop of these enormous changes that have taken place in the world, let us rewrite a military budget based on those realities. We have done that. We have come to a figure. We believe, for example, that by 1996, four years from now, that we can literally, using now year dollars and a baseline of $301 billion, that we can cut the military budget in half and that we begin the march to one half of the budget authority of the military budget with a cut of $50 billion in budget authority this year. That will produce us in excess of $400 billion, not million, $400 billion. Continuing to use the $301 billion baseline, if we just simply agreed to allow the military budget to stay at steady state, at one half for fiscal year 1997 through the year 2000, that would save $150 billion per year multiplied by the four years is an additional $600 billion. In less than 60 seconds, Mr. Chairman, I have answered the question. Is there a peace dividend? Our answer is yes. That looking from fiscal year 1993 to fiscal year 2000, an eight-year period, we see in now year dollars one trillion dollars, not in smoke and mirrors, not in accounting procedure, but real dollars, so that we can radically alter the nature of the debate. When this gentleman first walked in here in 1971, arguing to change the priorities of the nation, the response was the Soviet threat and the communist menace. The Warsaw Pact has vanished off the radar screen. The, um, the uh, Soviet Union has diminished in extraordinary fashion. The second argument was, where are we going to get the money? I just showed you a trillion dollars in eight years, so that the debate can change, not where, where we spend money, but, but, but not whether we spend money, but where we spend money. In this budget, we choose to take that peace dividend and shock this economy and to address the economic and social dislocation of America. We think that that's how you energize this economy, by producing jobs and the economic infrastructure, <coughs> increasing education, coming to grips with the issue of health, and a number of other critical problems. Finally, I would just say that our major thrust here is economic conversion. We realize that there is going to be pain and economic dislocation as the military budget goes down. We want to confront that with compassion, caring, and substance. But we also want to remind members that there was pain in this country as the military budget went up. Based on the distorted priorities, the, the benign neglect that resulted from the distorted priorities of a military budget rapidly rising to an excess of $300 billion. So we want to address both levels of pain. The pain as the military budget goes down, a robust economic conversion program. The pain for those people who were left out as the military budget rose rapidly over the past 10 and 12 years, and, and that's why we want to come to grips with the economic and social dislocation of the nation. So to summarize, we, we hope that you would place this alternative uh, before the body. We, th we have worked very hard. We are very proud of, of our work. To lead me to the second point, we would like an open airing. We're prepared to debate this matter for several days. Now, we know the reality is that that's not going to happen, but we certainly think that the, that the Congress and the American people ought to slow down at this incredible moment, this moment pregnant with such extraordinary potential 
to slow down and discuss the direction of this nation as we pursue uh, new uh, national security concerns based on updated realities as per our national threat, and number two, to address the, the social and economic conditions of this nation that have gone begging for too many years that have created and produced such extraordinary pain. So we're asking for as much time as possible to give us an opportunity to argue our case, to, to not only grapple with each other, but to grapple with you, other members of Congress, and to bring the American people along with what we perceive to be a bold, bold and visionary uh, thrust for the nation. And I thank you for your generosity. Thank you. Ms. Wallace. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd first like to thank Congressman Dellums for the work and the leadership that he has provided to bring us to this point. Um, Mr. Dellums' work is uh, not only commended by me and others, but I think those of you who serve on this committee and served in this Congress for a while recognize this is not the first time that he's given leadership to uh, putting together an alternative <coughs> budget. Uh, with the Congressional Black Caucus, and I think it is important for us all uh, to show our appreciation to him by simply thanking him for the leadership that he provides. In addition to that, I'd like to thank the Chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus, Congressman Towns, for not only uh, agreeing that this must be a priority for the Congressional Black Caucus, but working uh, very, very hard to ensure that we not only get to this point, but to try and influence you so that we can have adequate time on the floor to debate this important document to all of the members of the Congressional Black <coughs> Caucus, to all of the members of the Progressive Caucus and their staffs who have worked to bring us to this point. Uh, my sincere uh, thanks and gratitude. As a new member, this has been a most pleasing experience working with all of those that I have mentioned to put together this alternative budget. Uh, sometimes the uh, people of the United States do not realize um, how many various groups, caucuses, et cetera, we have in Congress and how hard sometimes we often work uh, to help this body have the input uh, and reflect the diversity that is present uh, in our society. Um, as a new member, I came to this Congress with great expectation that there was going to be a peace dividend. Prior to being elected to office, watching what was taking place and involving myself in town hall meetings, um, we all saw the changes that were taking place in this world. And as my constituents and others, as I've traveled around this country, debated the extraordinary occurrences that were just alluded to by Congressman Dellums, we all talked about the forthcoming peace dividend. Some people would like to discuss the peace dividend in terms of poor people and social programs having some expectation that they will get some money. Let me tell you, just as we have the debate on the middle class now and who is the middle class, and there's a graying of uh, who is and who is not in the middle class, and we have people in wide ranges of uh, income and um, assets believing that they are part of the middle class, let me just share with you that those people who are debating the peace dividend and being recipients of a peace dividend is just in, 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 uh, two is in a wide range. We don't just have poor people and programs talking about it. We have working people. We have so-called middle-income people who have some expectation that their lives are going to be made a little bit better because the sacrifices that they have made in order to fund a great military um, budget here in this Congress somehow will be rewarded because now that it is no longer needed, people who go to work every day who cannot afford health care, people who go to work every day and cannot uh, get the job training that they're needed in order to have um, a reasonable future, people who go to work every day who expect that America will hold out and uh, the promise for uh, education for their children all expect to participate in some kind of peace dividend. This budget recognizes these new world realities and it helps to instruct this Congress as to how we can spend this peace dividend and how we can cut back on a military budget that we no longer need. I have worked on a portion of this 
recognizing again uh, the need for dollars in conversion and the ability to train our people who are no longer in military jobs and no longer in jobs that are needed in this country, help them to train for the new world order. But I've also worked on some very, very basic areas such as the area of veterans affairs. Now I know that perhaps we don't like to talk about it because there is a belief in this country that veterans are treated very well. We celebrate them, we have parades, we salute them, and we talk about how wonderful they are. But the fact of the matter is, their hospitals are falling apart in America. Graveyards and cemeteries are falling in unkept. The fact of the matter is, one third of all of those who are homeless in America are veterans. The fact of the matter is, their homes are being foreclosed on. If there's any one constituency or population that I think everybody agrees on, and it is politically correct to talk about, it is veterans. <coughs> veterans have been getting cut back in the national budget all during the 80s. And as we approach this budget, they are robbing Peter to pay Paul. And while there's a small increase for medical benefits in the budget, they cut back in other areas. For example, they increase the population of veterans that must be involved in co-payments. And these are even service-connected veterans who have served their country, who we have saluted, who we talk about, we honor. We're asking them when they come to get medical care, even if they have served in the war, that, that they must pay a part of that through this co-payment system. In addition to that, they've cut back on travel allowances for veterans in this budget. It is shameful, and I intend to talk about it. In my stump speeches everywhere I go, people don't expect a Maxine Waters to talk about veterans. They think perhaps I'm only gonna talk about children, I'm only gonna talk about education, but Mr. Chairman, I'm going to be in the faces of those who claim they love the veterans so much, and I'm going to tell them what America is really doing to veterans. This administration and this budget does not honor veterans. They ought to be angry, they ought to march on this Capitol because they are not recognized, and who better deserves a peace dividend than they. If they fought for peace, if that's what we told them we were sending them for, then indeed they deserve the opportunity to share in the peace dividends. I was not here for the Budget Reconciliation Act of 1990, and I certainly did not participate in that discussion, but I sure have an opportunity to participate in it now. I think that those who are not wise enough to understand that we have the ability and should have the flexibility to rethink what we have done. What we did in 1990 is simply not correct because we did it in 1990. It is important for wise people to understand that you may have done something that was good then, but it doesn't make good sense now. As I promote the welfare of veterans, as I talk to them about those who say they love them, as I get them from focusing on the ceremony and on the reality, I am going to continue to talk about what our budgets do not do for them and what this budget will do for them. Not only do we recognize the need for education and job training, we put more money into this budget for the VA hospitals because they are shameful. And it's going to be one of the blights on Americans' history if we don't do something about it. This is only tip of the iceberg. I have shared with you just a little bit of what I feel. I didn't have a long time to talk about conversion in some of the other areas, but Mr. Chairman, you give us the opportunity on the floor where we will have good debate, where we will be able to engage each other, and where I'll be able to say to America what is not in this budget, particularly as it relates to veterans. And hopefully, this will change the minds of some of the members of Congress, and we'll be able to move toward getting that peace dividend. If we give you, <coughs> we give you more in, time on the floor. What's in our budget, not, what's in budget. Our budget right. not what is in the other budget. If budgets. we give you more time on the floor, every veteran will have a private room in a VA hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, you, you, I'm sure you're aware of the the latest ploy to uh, uh, commingle uh, civilians in in some of the veterans' hospitals. There's a pilot, uh, a couple of 
pilot projects that were led by VA that talked about opening up uh, some of the hospitals in rural areas so that citizens could access them, the veterans make a good case. And they say to them, look, you're not doing good by us. We don't have good health care in these VA hospitals. How can we talk about being generous enough to share bed space and some other kinds of things when in fact you have not honored us with basic good care? They have opposed it and guess what? Even though I'm concerned about health care and about those who don't have access with the outside of the veterans, they're right. They need to focus America on the fact that the hospitals are not doing what they're supposed to do. No, I, I, I was just stopped from a uh, fellow I served in World War II with and that's a very hot item with the veterans this year. That's right. If you don't believe it, ask Senator Simpson, who was <laughs> pounced upon by the disabled veterans when he tried to defend uh, the policy. <laughs> Ms. Pelosi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you know, it's an honor to serve in the Congress, and I don't feel that honor any more strongly than on a day when I can come and join the Congressional Black Caucus and the Progressive Caucus in putting forth a statement of values that I think more accurately reflects what the American people want than what they have been receiving or what they would anticipate receiving if this debate does not take place. Uh, I believe each year that these, when we have the debate on the, the budget uh, that we are debating a statement of values. And I would like to ask every member of this committee and every member of the Congress if the budgets that we have passed are a statement of their values. Uh, my colleagues uh, who have spoken before me have very eloquently uh, put forth the case uh, for our being able to go to the floor with this as an amendment uh, or an alternative, and I hope that uh, this committee will, uh, will vote um, in the affirmative on that. I would like to submit a statement for the record, but just, just again like to praise Mr. Towns, Ms. Waters, uh, my colleague Mr. Dellums, and our new colleague Mr. Sanders. Uh, for their work on this. I'd like to make a couple of points, uh, Mr. Chairman, in agreeing, associating myself with the remarks of those who have gone before. As I said, this is a statement of our values. This morning we had Secretary Baker in our appropriations hearing, and the answer to a number of questions were, uh, the, the, the Secretary would say, it's a changing world. The world is changing. The walls have come down and, 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 and asking for peacekeeping uh, money in, in that committee. It is a changing world. The Secretary is correct. The Berlin Wall did come down. Now it should be able, easy for us to take down the walls of the budget agreement and consider something different. This is about leadership. It's about American ingenuity. Uh, our colleague, Mr. Dellum, said that there, was, there would be pain bringing the budget, changing the budget, and there was pain in the years where the defense budget grew. We hear about the budget deficit. We hear about the trade deficit. But we have a tremendous social action deficit in this country. How can we answer to the children of the, of this, uh, the last 10, 12 years uh, for their lack of housing, uh, quality education, even food in some cases, um, uh, health care, et cetera? Uh, how can we answer to them without at least making an attempt to have an influence on what the final product is. Of course, I'd like it to be this budget. The realities are such that here we can only hope to influence, to make some difference in what the final product is. And I believe that in order to address some of the um, concerns or the, the deficit of the, of the past 10 years in terms of the social action deficit, in, in order to address the challenge that economic conversion brings to us, we, the, American, the Americans who have uh, in our history, always been the refreshing, exhilarating, tonic to the rest of the world because of the way we have addressed problems differently because of how we have taken the lead. We have that opportunity now to show the way, to turn away from this huge defense budget, to do so in a way that, that uh, is sensitive to the concerns of workers by our emphasis on economic conversion, by saying, uh, my colleague uh, Congresswoman Waters talked about the veterans. I'd like to talk with the same, uh, I won't take the time to, but hopefully on the floor we can talk in the same vein about the children of America and how their needs have been neglected. It's about leadership. It's about seeing earlier than others what an answer for the future really is. We are the Congress of the United States. If we don't do it, this debate won't take place. Um, and talking about this budget each year, but this year it being a, a, a significant one because of the other changes in the world, I've always said uh, what Satchel Paige said about his age. When they asked him how old he was, he said, how old would I be if I didn't know how old I was? What would a budget be 
if we didn't know what last year's budget it was? Why should we build on that? Why shouldn't we take it from ground up and talk about what this budget should be in terms of our values, in terms of our country's needs? I hope that this committee will give us the opportunity. And again, I want to thank my colleagues for inviting me to join them here. It is a, it is a special occasion for me to be able to associate myself with the remarks of my colleagues as they address uh, what is very fundamental to our country, our values. Without Thank objection, the young lady's uh, state, entire statement here on the record. Thank you. Uh, be, before I introduce Mr. Saunders, I, uh, when I talked about every veteran would have a private role, I, I, I was just praising your, your, uh, you were so articulate that, that uh, you could sway anybody on the floor. I, I'm not saying I'm against every veteran having a private role. So. <laughs> Let the record reflect that I understood you perfectly. <laughs> My two brothers uh, would disown me. <laughs> Mr. Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and when you go last on a distinguished um, panel like this, it's hard to add much to what has already been said. Uh, but let me begin by saying that, like Mrs. Waters, this is my first year in the Congress, and I was mayor of Vermont's largest city for eight years. And back in Vermont, when we were trying to find some sense in what was going on in the Congress, uh, we found that sense in the Congressional Black Caucus, who year after year gave millions of Americans hope in terms of developing a sensible set of priorities that work for ordinary Americans and not just for the wealthy or not just for the military industrial complex. So it gives me a great deal of pleasure uh, to be here today as part of a newly formed informal caucus called the Progressive Caucus, uh, which in many ways uh, shares exactly the same views uh, as our brothers and sisters in the Black Caucus. So it's, it's a personal pleasure uh, for me to be here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just this last week there was a poll done in the largest paper in my state, the Burlington Free Press, uh, and not too surprisingly it indicated that 19 percent of Americans thought the United States Congress was doing a good job. The President was not far ahead of that, but that was 81 percent thought that we were not representing effectively their interests. Mr. Chairman, as Mr. Dellums and others have said, if there has ever been an opportunity in the history of our lifetime to make <laughs> fundamental changes in national priorities and to give hope to tens and tens of millions of Americans who has lost hope in the system, now is the time. And if we blow this opportunity, if we do not make significant cuts in military spending and reinvest in this country, history will never forgive us. Now, how much worse do we have to do in terms of how the people of America feel about us before we begin to catch on that we are not representing the needs of working people, elderly people, poor people, farmers, veterans, all of those people who know that the system is not giving them a fair shake. And I find it ironic, and I wish I had the record in front of us. For so many years, many of us, some here in Congress, some back in the cities and towns of America, were saying, cut the military budget. And every year there was a different reason why the military budget could not be cut. And I listen with strained amusement to hear that now that the Soviet Union no longer exists, it's not there on the map, the Warsaw Pact no longer exists, and yet there are people who are telling us that we still need to spend $130 billion a year defending Western Europe and Germany against the Warsaw Pact, despite the fact that that pact no longer exists. Mr. Chairman, we may or may not have won the Cold War. That's a difficult equation. We know that the Soviet Union lost the Cold War. They're no longer in existence. But I think if you ask the American people whether we won the Cold War, they may not be so certain. The gap between the rich and the poor in this country is wider than virtually any other industrialized nation on Earth. Our standard of living of our working people are in decline. We have, for ordinary Americans, one of the worst health care systems in the entire world, one of two nations without a national health care system. Our educational system in many respects is falling apart. You may have seen in the papers the results of the international uh, uh, exams given foreign students and Americans in terms of math and science. Many of our working class kids can't afford to go to college. Crime rate is soaring. We have two million people sleeping out on the street. 
millions of low-income people paying 50, 60, 70 percent of limited incomes for housing, our veterans. Today I met with a dozen veterans from the state of Vermont, and I want to echo what Mrs. Waters had to say. When you want them to go to war, you bring out the bands, you bring out the flags. Come on, guys, we got a good war for you. But 40 years after the war, after World War II, after Korea, after Vietnam, when these guys are 60 and 70 and 80, and they have to wait on lines in inadequate VA hospitals, where are the flags then? Where is our respect for the veterans? How could this Congress cut veterans programs by three and a half billion dollars? in the 1990 Budget Reconciliation Agreement. When you want the votes of the senior citizens, it's easy to go out. 1990 Budget Reconciliation cut tens of billions of dollars from uh, Medicare for our elderly. I can go on and on and on. But the bottom line is, and I don't think there's much debate about it, the American people are losing faith in their government. They don't vote anymore. They don't believe that we can represent their interests. And I think what all of us are saying in one form or another, is that now is the time to reinvest in America. Let's make sure our veterans have what they're entitled to. Let's do away tomorrow with the disgrace, Mr. Chairman, five million children in the United States of America are hungry today. Let's deal with that reality. Let's deal with the environmental problems. Let's give some hope to the people of this country. Now, the choice is not a complicated choice. You are gonna have to defend whether or not we maintain a bloated military budget or whether we go back to our people and reinvest in America. And if we do not seize this opportunity now, uh, it is just hard for me to understand uh, how we can uh, go back to our communities and tell them uh, we are doing the job. So I beg of you, Mr. Chairman, don't continue the status quo. Do not continue it. The world has radically changed and now it is the time to radically change our own priorities. We can do it. We can make this country number one in all the important human respects. Let's do it. And let's support this budget that has been brought before you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanders. Mr. Billington. I would ask, and perhaps one of you mentioned this before I came in the room, how much time in debate are you requesting of the committee? Eight hours. Eight hours? Yes. Um, this would, uh, would this be all in one day? Would this be divided between two days of consideration? Um, We're just asking for the time. Uh, there has been some controversy. Mr. Dellums, I uh, recall from previous years, yes. there has been some controversy about the time in which, at which the debate was scheduled. Yes. Sometimes it was very late at night. Or you've, uh, members of the Black Caucus felt that it was not when people were listening or not when they were watching uh, television. Is, is this a concern also at this time? Uh, I think everyone's sensitive to that, uh, I'd say to my colleague from Texas, um, we certainly don't want to come up at midnight w when everyone's on a coffee break. This is a, as we said, this is a historic moment, it's an important moment, uh, we'd like to engage the Congress. Frankly, we think if there, you know, there are roughly four alternatives. We think at a minimum each alternative ought to have its day to be discussed and to be debated, allow American people to focus on that. But uh, in my heart of hearts, in my mind, I don't think that every proposal wants to see a full light of day. Uh, uh, and if they don't, fine, let them yield back their time. But we would like a day to be able to, to, to challenge our, our colleagues. The significance is so extraordinary that just stopping for one day is, is, is not a big deal. We just want to make sure that it takes place. We engage our colleagues. We don't want it, we don't want it to turn into a special order when everybody's not there, if you know what I mean. A, uh, they're sensitive to us. B, I think they want to accommodate us. I think what they're trying to work out, I'm, I'm sure eventually they'll work out with you, is to, is, is to how that practically uh, gets done. I think they understand what we're saying. I think that they clearly are sympathetic to what we're saying. And we recognize in that large room uh, full of members that you couldn't work it out, that eventually it would be the leadership and the, the leadership of this committee working it out in, in detail. We're confident. That, that adequate time will be provided for us to be able to engage the Congress and engage the country. Well, you've made a, a very full uh, presentation, and your, and your document is, uh, is impressive. And uh, obviously, uh, uh, this committee will want to accommodate you to pr permit the budget to be offered, and it's only a question of exactly how much time is involved, and I, I suppose that we'll have further discussions about that, Mr. Chairman. I might just say one a couple of very quick things. One, 
we, we spent nearly four months on this budget, so this is very serious. It's not a fly-by-night operation. We spent a great deal of time thinking. And secondly, just to say to you why I underscore the, the importance of the moment, most of us spend our lives in politics tinkering at the margins of policies that predate us. But here we now have an opportunity to step back and to actually shape new policy. That is so incredibly exciting, so extraordinarily important. The economic and social imperative so great that, that, that we think we ought to seize the time and we're asking you to the maximum extent that you can cooperate uh, with us to provide us the time to make our best case. I would like to compliment all the members who have appeared today and testified because uh, I think the, yeah, your case has been well made. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, I don't have any questions. I would like to uh, applaud and congratulate this panel and have them take back uh, my thanks and I hope our committee's thanks to the respective members of the two caucuses in regard to the work that has been done. It is a, a stunning technical achievement for a very small group of people to put together a complete one and a half trillion dollar budget that meets all of the budget guidelines and assumptions that are required, especially without the resources of an executive branch of government to participate in that process. And the Congressional Black Caucus year after year puts together a, a budget that is recognized by almost all participants as being one that is technically at least equal, if not superior, to that of any product that is produced. But more important than the technical achievement, I think, is the, the political courage uh, that it takes to bring forward this budget alternative. Just a very few weeks ago, we listened to the President of the United States on the floor of the uh, Congress of the United States saying that over five years that he would call for a $50 billion cut in the defense budget, this and no more. Now, $50 billion may sound like a lot to those who have not examined the budgets of this country, uh, but in fact, when I got home and was explaining to constituents in Kansas City, uh, many of them did not realize that this amounted to less than 1% of our national budget each and every year, that this was not the peace dividend that they had been led to believe could eventually come from the reduced tensions that we have with the uh, Eastern Bloc nations. So. This budget, the Congressional Black Caucus, the Progressive Caucus budget that comes to the floor is in fact the only budget that provides a stunning alternative to what the President proposed. Uh, it's, it's almost too good to be true when you hear people talk in terms of one trillion dollar savings over eight years uh, from a budget that's being proposed to us here in the Rules Committee. Uh, but in fact, uh, for those of us who have examined the numbers, and I hope for the other members of Congress who have not yet had the opportunity, but will see this budget on the floor, those numbers are very real, they are very practical, and they are very doable. And they can make an immense difference uh, to the lives of each and every American who, whose lives are in fact shaped by the budgets that we pass each and every year in this body. So I, I do hope and expect that under your leadership that this committee will provide uh, these two organizations the opportu opportunity to present this budget on the floor uh, with all of the time necessary to make clear its ramifications and, and what the policy changes would be necessary to put this budget into effect. Uh, I think given the, that opportunity and given the time to do that on the floor that uh, many members of this Congress will choose to support this budget as, as I have done in the past and as a number of other members have done in the past and, and hopefully we will see real changes in the country as a result. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, I won't take up the, the committee's time because I was called out, out, out of the committee, but uh, I certainly support their right to offer your substitute and uh, I would be supporting that in the Rules Committee. Thank you. Mr. Solomon. Ms. Slaughter. Ms. Slaughter. It's all right. No, that's all right. I, uh, <laughs> New York, this, this we, is a callback, Mike. We New Yorkers Mike. are all alike. This is a callback, Mike. <laughs> I, I just simply want to say, Mr. Chairman, that the people before us here are some of the most thoughtful and hardworking members of this House. And, and I join with my other colleagues in, in saying that I look forward to the debate and budget that they put forth because every year an awful lot of it makes a great deal of sense. And I thank you for your efforts. Thank you. Would the gentlewoman yield to me? I'd be happy to. Um, just, just briefly, um, let me say, we will make an effort to expand upon this. But just for a moment, I would like you and members of the committee to reflect on, on this important reality. On January 22nd of this year, the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, Mr. Gates, appeared alongside 
uh, Lieutenant General Clapper, the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, made several observations. Number one, that the former Soviet Union military is on the decline, that Russian weapon procurement is down by 80 percent, research and development down by 30 percent, that the former Soviet Union strategic capability on the decline, and finally, uh, almost a verbatim quote from General Clapper, that uh, the former Soviet Union posed no conventional threat to the United States nor to Warsaw. Which means then yeah. that the two major threats that have acted, acted as the linchpin for America's high level of military readiness over the last four and a half decades, the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union, in the case of the Warsaw Pact, it's vanished off the radar screen, and our two directors of our intelligence agency saying in open session, that the Soviet Union is on a significant decline. Now, if you look at a $300 billion budget, which we've had, that those two threats are reflected in dollars at the level of between 50 and 70 percent of our, of, of our budget, which means that you don't have to be a rocket scientist to realize that we've been spending between 150, not 130, 150 and 210 billion dollars per annum on those two threats alone, one of which totally vanished, one now almost off the radar screen, and with 210 billion dollars worth of threat virtually gone, a meager $10 billion a year speaks loudly for itself. And when we talk about a $50 billion cut in budget authority, that in my opinion is no radical idea. If former secretary, if former director of the CIA, William Colby, can say on national television that he believes that you can cut the military budget in half in five years, that this is no way out idea. We just, you know, I, I didn't want to see William Kobe to the left of us, so we got there in our, <laughs> uh, we got there in four years. He wants to get there in five. But the point of it is, is that there are minds out there on either side of this matter, on, on, uh, away from partisanship and away from politics, who understand objectively that the world's changed. Our budget attempts to reflect that. Well, I, and I thank you for that. You're certainly welcome. I, there's no great clamor in my district to continue to spend money to protect West Germany from East Germany. <laughs> <laughs> they married each other. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The chair will be very happy now to hear from the very patient, the very honorable Ike Skelton. I think so. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment before you. The amendment would be to both the proposed, I'm sorry, the amendment would be to both the proposed budget A and budget B. It deals with the defense budget, and much has been said about the defense budget today in both sides of the issue. But Mr. Chairman, I speak today to keep us from making another mistake here in Congress. Back in 1935, when most people in the world thought that this was a peaceful globe, the fourth of a series of naval disarmament conferences was held. During that time of 1935, discussing the cuts in then the major systems of the world, uh, the Navy armament, the seeds for World War II were not only well planted, but they were growing both in Germany and in Imperial Japan. I'm here to urge this Congress not to make a similar mistake. After every war in this country's history, we have precipitately cut back on our national defense, beginning with the revolution. This century, 
we have drastically cut and reduced our defense posture from after World War I, World War II, after Korea, and after Vietnam. And we have lived to regret it at the price of young American lives on the battlefield. After World War I, which was the war termed the war to end all wars, we had to rearm and fight on two fronts in World War II, some 23 years later. Five years later, we found ourselves in a massive invasion into the South and had to fight again in Korea. We found ourselves in Vietnam and we cut back after that. All of us remember, and Mr. Chairman, you and I were in Congress at the time, uh, 1978, 1979, 1980, when we had a hollow military. And there was a captain of a ship down here at Norfolk, Virginia, that refused to take a ship out because he didn't have sufficiently trained sailors on that ship. Consequently, we found ourselves in deep trouble and built up a military beginning in the late 1980s that went up into the middle of the 1980s. We won a Cold War. There's no question about that. The fact that we built up, had allies, and were the leader of this military combination allowed us to stand the ground and the Soviet Union uh, crumble with its excessive military uh, armaments and communism not working. We won that. We won it without a nuclear holocaust. But we were there and we were prepared and as a result we won that. This time last year all of us were glued to the television set and the wake of one of the best examples of military uh, leadership uh, and, comp and, and competency on the battlefield that we've ever seen. We're very proud of what we had. We had then and we have today, Mr. Chairman, something that works well within this country, and that's the United States military. Problems, yes, they have. When called upon, they did an outstanding job, and all of us, needless to say, are quite proud of them. I offer an amendment today which I truly hope you will allow to be heard. That is the amendment to both proposals A and B for the Cheney figures. Chairman Aspen of the Armed Services Committee asked us to put together our thoughts on a proposed budget for suggestions uh, to the uh, Budget Committee. I took this quite seriously, uh, visiting with untold numbers of people, visiting Fort Hood, Texas, visiting Fort Leavenworth, picking their best brains. I'm mainly concerned in the personnel, and I'm mainly concerned in the O&M, which means level of training. In my figures, which were arrived at after a great deal of effort. And Mr. Chairman, this is a difficult thing to do. Uh, rather than slice off the top to build up from the bottom. But I did that. I came with an $83 million figure of Mr. Cheney's budget uh, in the personnel area. So consequently, rather than muddy the water, I offer uh, those figures in my amendment uh, because it is so relatively close to the figures that I came up with. This reduction at this time is different from previous times. Uh, people in the military are there as volunteers. They weren't drafted. Also, there is an economy uh, problem concerning the re recession. I think it's a shame for this country to send a sergeant home with a pink slip after showing bravery and courage on the battlefield in Kuwait and Iraq. Industry, Mr. Chairman, also needs time to adjust in its cutbacks in defense budget. In all 
previous wars, uh, the reductions have been such that we save money. But because of the law that we have passed and the allowances that we have for those who will be put out of the military in this all-volunteer force, it will cost money rather than save money to put people out. So consequently, let's look at the whole picture. Number one, it's not going to save that immense amount of money. Number two, as much is said about conversion and reconversion to what? Right now we have a large unemployment in this country. We send the sergeants home with a pink slip, and where are they to find jobs and training for what? So consequently, I urge very seriously uh, that this amendment uh, be allowed. Uh, I think it's one that this Congress should face up front and have the opportunity to vote upon. And that, Mr. Chairman, I rest my case. Thank you, sir. It's good as always to hear from our friend and my classmate, distinguished gentleman from Missouri, uh, Mr. Solomon. <coughs> Ike, you. Uh if you watch C-SPAN, the replay of this uh, hearing earlier today, uh, you uh, you almost repeated verbatim my speech uh, earlier. So uh, is, is that something like great minds thinking <laughs> in uh, the, the same? Uh, but uh, you you certainly uh, uh, stated my my views so clearly and succinctly. He did it better uh, than you did. Uh, he, he certainly did. Sure. Let me, let me, he certainly did. And I'll be interested to see if you react to him the way you did to me. <laughs> uh, Ike, you know, I you react are. better to him than I do to you. <laughs> Ike Skelton is uh, perhaps, at least in the eyes of us Republicans, he is, he is perhaps uh, the Democrat most responsible, along with a fellow by the name of Sam Stratton. Good Democrat, great, great friend of mine. Served on your Armed Services Committee for 30 years. But uh, the Democrat most responsible, I think, for developing that peace through strength policy that changed things around. And I remember when I came here in 1978 and Jimmy Carter, the President of the United States, who tried so, so hard to, to seek the, the freedom of the hostages overseas uh, in Iran. And he attempted with that military you just described to, uh, to rescue those hostages and it was a, a total failure. It wasn't Jimmy Carter's fault. It was the fault of the condition of our military where they had to cannibalize uh, helicopter gunships just to get a few that would work and then they failed. And that was the condition of our military. It was a, a sad, sad thing. And to see what has happened, uh, culminating with, with, uh, with Desert Storm, with, uh, with uh, that magnificent display uh, that we had that saved so many thousands of lives. I remember hearing uh, reports that we might lose 10,000 lives in that, in that desert storm situation. And, you know, it ended up with, with, with just so few. And that was because of what you folks did on that Armed Services Committee that uh, they gave them the wherewithal and the training to do that. So, uh, I, uh, naturally, I support your, your amendment uh, uh, very much. Uh, I even suggested that uh, we have an amendment made in order that would separate uh, the two budgets, the A plan and the B plan, and let the Congress vote separately on the floor. Ike's not for that one. No, I know he's not, uh, but uh, it would give us uh, an opportunity then to have those clear-cut votes that we need. This way, uh, we just aren't going to have it, and it's going to be unfortunate because it does jeopardize what we're all trying to do, and that is to, to maintain a, a decent, adequate military that can provide for the protection of this country, both here and overseas. Mr. Solomon, first, yeah. thank you for your uh, very, very kind uh, uh, words. Let me tell you, before all of this came about, there was a proposed six-year 25% reduction in our military. Now, the President recommended an additional $50 billion. Now, what does this mean in people who have done a good job, who are dedicated, and who have become professionals at what they are. If you look at the Army, it's not a 25% cut in manpower. Mr. Chairman, it's a 32% cut in manpower. That's what it is, 32% cut. And we are scheduled under the Cheney proposal 
to go down to a 3.9 percent of the gross national product, which is the same figure we had back in 1939, prior to World War II. Mr. Chairman, this is a very uncertain world. I promise you that the next conflict in which we are involved, and heaven forbid, but it will come to pass because history is made that way, and human beings, unfortunately, are made that way. We cannot sit here and predict. Who could have predicted Pearl Harbor? Who could have predicted Saddam Hussein coming south into Kuwait? Who could have predicted North Korea going into the south? You just can't look into a crystal ball and say this is what we need to prepare ourselves for. We're coming down, according to that budget, the Cheney budget, 25% plus $50 billion over the next five years. Let's not send the sergeant home who did well and made a profession of arms in the service of his country with a pink slip. Mr. Weed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <coughs> if I may address my remarks uh, to Mr. Sorry. Solomon, uh, I, I hesitate to return to uh, this morning's debate, uh, but uh, the Chairman's patience, uh, with some good reason, was exhausted before those of us on this end of the table got to speak about uh, your suggestions this morning, and uh, you're probably not surprised to find I disagreed with you strenuously with the suggestions that uh, the military could in some ways become a, a jobs program for the future. But I do want to take this opportunity to agree with you just as strongly this afternoon uh, with my uh, high regard and respect for, for Mr. Skelton and for the statements that he's made this afternoon. Ike and I have, I can have districts next to each other, and Ike, I know that you have been a very thoughtful scholar of the military, of where it has come, of where our security needs are headed in the future. Uh, I happen to disagree with you uh, about uh, some of the assessments that have been made, but I do think that there, these are important considerations and that this debate ought to occur on the, House of the, on the floor of the House of Representatives. And I, for one, would support your right to uh, bring this amendment to the floor. I think we ought to very clearly make a determination as to where our defense needs uh, are headed in the very near future, and we ought to make a choice between the numbers that have been proposed by the President, by the Secretary of Defense, and by an alternative set of numbers that we've just talked about uh, here in the Rules Committee. So uh, I do hope that we make the amendment in order, and, and I hope we will be able to have a debate on the floor of the House of Representatives between very thoughtful people who uh, have the same goals and values in mind for their country. Well, I, I, I uh, if I may respond, uh, uh, Mr. Tweed, I, I, I appreciate your kind words more than I can say. Uh, uh, I think it's very important uh, that we do have this debate. I would be glad to share my, my figures, which uh, came about as a result of great painstaking work, uh, where I did come within the $83 million uh, of, of that proposal. Uh, it was not arrived at lightly, and consequently, I, I think that uh, it, it should be uh, debated. And I thank you very much for your support. Mr. McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> I, too, uh, wish to express my appreciation to you, uh, Mr. Skelton. Uh, Ike, when people discuss this issue in the terms that you do, invariably they discuss history. When people who take the other view, they invariably discuss what their conversation was on the bus stop this morning. And uh, when you look at the history of man, the history of the United States, and what happens when nations are not prepared to maintain the peace, uh, then they learn this over and over and over again. It's interesting also to note that those who will be so forcefully opposed to your position, if you look at their background, you'll see that they were strongly opposed to the M1 tank, for example. And yet, uh, for years, we took the lectures from Phil Donahue and the other defense wizards about how the M1 tank wouldn't work and was too expensive and, and the computer chips would melt in the heat and the sand would get in the engine and all that. We, Helen Caldicott, they used to do that year after year after year. Whenever it came up for funding, they'd always have some special panel on, on these talk shows. And yet anyone associated with the M1 tank, anyone associated in maintenance or, or uh, as a logistician or any associated with the M1 tank in Desert Storm did not receive a Band-Aid. We didn't lose a single tank to an enemy tank. 
and we can go on with a single plane to an enemy plane. But those who opposed all of those investments, those who opposed all the upgrading, are now coming to jump in the front of the parade and to tell us what we should do, go from here, when they've consistently been in error. In fact, uh, uh, our colleague that was just speaking just shortly before you, as you heard, with, with great volume, uh, had, cons had perhaps the strongest and longest series of back-to-back -back misstatements that I've ever enjoyed before uh, in this area. So when it comes to the Patriot missile, when it comes to investment and all these, uh, you have been right and they have been wrong. In the final statements uh, on the f before the vote, I was asked to, to, on Desert Storm to close the debate. And I, I remember beginning with the words that uh, my daughter had given me as we left the day before because her teacher had asked her, tomorrow, how is your father going to vote for peace or for war? And I pointed out the fact of how simple life is when you know no history. And when, uh, when peace in our time in 1938, in which Neville Chamberlain was so proud of himself and stood there on Heston Field having stepped off the tri-motor and waved the piece of paper in which I have the Fuhrer's signature in my hand, just pleased as punch with himself. People lined the streets. I couldn't even turn into Downing Street because the throng was so great. One person, one person watching it all, who understood history, who understood what it truly meant, and they asked him how he felt about it. And Winston Churchill said the Prime Minister had to choose between war and shame, and he chose both. Now, anyone who understands history understands that for a nation to arbitrarily and willy-nilly walk off from its security will invariably have to revert and go back. And when it does, it will do so at a price. Now, what you've suggested is, and, and what I find novel, and what our debate has been most of the day here, Mr. Skelton, has been that people say the world has changed, therefore we can, we can reduce expenditures, which are fine. But they don't want to reduce expenditures to cut the deficit. They want to reduce expenditures for some other program. And what you've pointed out is that when a, an unemployed inner city youth from a broken home is given the opportunity to wear the uniform of his country, and we just had a ceremony at Wright-Patterson just yesterday in which the, you could tell for the, for the backgrounds of these soldiers with their wives and their children and, and, uh, and made us all proud of where they are and where they've become. Rather than allow them to participate in that program where they get a skill and where they are educated and where they're able to contribute not only to our society but also to the defense of our country, we want to put them through these regular inner, inner city programs where billions and billions of dollars disappear on a regular basis from which we get virtually no return and only, only worse problems. Therefore, I cannot help but wonder what the goal what the goal of the cut is, because not only do they want to d reduce defense, but they want to make sure that these destructive programs are funded uh, with the loss of the hope and opportunity that's given that inner city youth well, the to wear the uniform of his country. I, I, think, the, I think Mr. Skelton wishes to respond. I, I can uh, only thank uh, the gentleman from Ohio uh, for his comments uh, and your understanding of history. You protect a nation by people, as well as equipment, tanks, and planes and the like. We have a fine military today because of the people, the young men and young women who wear the uniform. The Army is going to get cut 32 percent under the Cheney proposal. I think that we should work it as best we can to maintain a strong military without throwing out the muscle in the whole effort. This is a very uncertain world in which we live. It's one that we should guard against the uncertainties of the future. Those who study history do so with horror when they read of the American efforts of an untrained army at the Kazarine Pass, what happened in the defense of South Korea by Task Force Smith, Desert One, all of us experienced that here in Congress. Let's not let that happen again. We can cut back 
and we're doing it. Uh, I have built up a proposal that comes within a stone's throw of the Cheney budget. That's why I suggest that this debate is probably the most important national security debate that we can have, not just this year, but probably in this decade. And I thank you, and I thank Mr. Wheat and the other gentlemen and the ladies for your uh, interest. If I could just point out one additional thing. One need not be an historian. I mean, one need not, not have to be schooled in this sort of thing. One has to have only any sort of memory at all. It was this time last year that we had emptied the pharmacies of America and the, and the hospitals of America with the nurses and the doctors and the working factories of America with, with troops that were defending our interests. That was, it, hasn't, it isn't like it, as though we would, uh, it's something that one needed to be really schooled in. You would think that they could recall. It was only just last August, which is less than uh, six months ago, that we were fearful that the entire array of, of nuclear weapons aimed and designed to destroy one nation, the United States of America, or as to who controlled them and where they were headed and the coup that was going on. So uh, it's, I know that it's always popular to say that peace is at hand and, and that the uh, world is now safe for democracy and that now we've finished the course and we can all uh, beat our swords into plowshares. But invariably, uh, we'll all be back here and the same crowd will be, will be telling us that uh, we it's somehow or another our fault, probably. Mr. Wheat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I hate to hold Mr. Skelton while I inquire of Mr. McEwen, but I, I would like to know how, uh, and I understand we have philosophical differences on this issue, and I understand that Mr. McEwen fancies himself a historian, and, and on that basis, we may have different views of, of our mil current military posture, though I haven't heard anyone today suggest that we should uh, somehow bring the security of the United States into question by, uh, by making some cuts in the military. And even Mr. Skelton points out that some military cuts are coming, though we clearly have differences as to the, the amount those cuts will be and, and when they will occur. But I've heard this, this statement several times today about the unemployed inner city youth from broken homes who now serve in the military and it's the, the fine upstanding youth that defended our country. And I know it's a historian that, being a historian that allows Mr. McEwen the ability to look at our military and its future needs, but what, what uh, facility is it that allows, uh, that allows you, Mr. McEwen, to look at these fine troops as, as you review them and tell that these are all people from uh, broken homes, in inner city youth who, who are desperately in need of employment in the military or, or, they, have, or they would have no other skill and no other uh, ability to serve our society. But uh, at the appropriate time, uh, that, I've been elaborating on that all day. Would the gentleman yield after he finishes? It is so argumentative and incorrect as it doesn't merit a response, but go ahead. Well, Mr. Yeah, McEwen, Mr. Wheat, uh, or, or Mr. Solomon, okay. I, I've just heard, okay. heard the remarks yeah. several times. You know, I just have to be a little offended about that because... Uh, I've, been, I've been offended by it well, more than once today. Well, you shouldn't he be, because if you go back and you, you read my remarks, uh, Mr. Wheat, and I was very explicit. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give the exact same speech in about two hours before the Veterans of Foreign Wars up at the Sheridan Hotel 2,000 young men and women up there, okay? The exact same speech. And what I said at that time was that we are, can be so proud of these young men and women that are serving in our military today because they are the brightest, the best equipped, the best trained, the most highly motivated young men and women that we've ever had in the military, even going back when I was in the military. And, we and, can be, and they come, I said. And, and in that, I would agree with okay, you completely, right. Mr. Solomon. And they come, as I said then, and I'll say tonight, and the speech is already written, you want to read it. They come from all across America, from all parts of America, from middle class America, from the rich, from the poor. And I said, many of them do come from the inner cities. They come from broken homes where, where they only had one parent. And what's wrong with our educational system today? Our teachers spend 75% of their time parenting in our schools when they should be teaching because the kids don't get the parenting at home. I mentioned these, we have these kind of kids that come out of the inner cities and, and out of these broken homes. And when they are there 
And they have got ingrained in them all of these things, respect and discipline and authority and the rule of law and how not to use drugs and on and on and on. When they finally hang up their uniform and they go back home to the inner cities or back to my middle class uh, suburb uh, in America, they take those ingrained principles and they teach them to their peers. And that lifts our society. That's what he's saying. Not, not that you're saying that they're all uh, from the inner cities. They're not. They're from a cross section of America. And thank God they are. They're wonderful people, wherever they come from. So, you know, give us a little credit because I share your, your sympathy for, for, for those people and for all the people. What Ike Skelton is saying that, you know, those jobs, military jobs, are real jobs. They're not private sector jobs. They're, they're, they're military jobs. They're just as good as the private sector. And we're always going to need it. As a matter of fact, I support universal military training for all of our kids. When I went in the Marine Corps after I flunked out of college, you know, uh, I was not a man. They taught me to be a man. That's what every young man ought to have today. And he'd come out a better person. That's all we're saying. Well, Mr. The gentleman, you. If, if, if I may reply first. And I appreciate the statement that you have made and, and the way in which you have made it. Uh, perhaps I misunderstood when I heard Mr. McEwen because I didn't hear the same kind of sensitivity coming from him at that moment uh, in regard to the statement about the uh, uh, reviewing the troops and, and seeing all these products of broken inner city homes. I certainly think that uh, products of the military can, can come out uh, awfully well and be of great value to our society. Uh, I like to think so personally because my father was a military officer. I, I grew up in a military family. But because you go out and, and look at a group of troops, uh, somehow, and, and troops that have performed a vital service to our society, does not mean somehow that these troops have no other capability of performing in our society than serving in the military. Just as they have been able to receive the discipline and the training and the education necessary to perform in the military, they can in other avenues of our society also. And that's what those of us who have been talking about conversion and about other opportunities and about reducing the military budget have been suggesting. And we, don't, and we certainly don't suggest, and, and perhaps I was in error if I, if I, when I heard you uh, imply that these troops were not, were not capable of, of, of other kinds Would of Would the gentleman yield? Also. Well, I certainly. respect everything you just said. That was a good statement. I thank my friend, and I think that the mere presence of Alan Wheat here in the Congress <laughs> on the Rules Committee makes Jerry Solomon's case. I wasn't in the military. I am the son of a Jerry Solomon type. My father was a Marine Corps drill instructor standing over me until I was 18 while I did Marine push-ups. And I think that when you, Alan, talk about coming out of a military family, I think that you're making Jerry's case right there. Okay, Ms. Slaughter. Mr. Chairman, it's all right with you. I'd like to try to bring this back to the business at hand here. And uh, first, of course, we all want to say how fond we are of Ike, but I can do it better than anybody because he's my cousin. Um, however, Ike, I, I think Mr. we're Chairman, all charged. Which I'm, which I'm, Im Im I'm immensely <laughs> proud of. No, but we're charged by the Constitution to take care of the national defense, and I don't think any of us here are talking about doing away with that. But we also have a responsibility here for domestic tranquility. And I. I think what we've done in the Budget Committee, Ike, is really take into account that we want to produce jobs and we want to take care of people who are dislocated. But if we learned anything at all from what's happened, we surely learned a lesson that you cannot have national security if you don't have economic security. Isn't that what's gone on in the Soviet Union? And it's very critical to us, I think, as long as we've got children unvaccinated, people uneducated, people out of work. Uh, as I said earlier this morning, and I think it really bears repeating, uh, the area that Jerry and I come from for 45 years has sent more money to Washington than we got back for the national defense. And we really need to be paying some attention to home now. And one of the things that's in this bill that I'm very proud of is that we're starting to look at the transportation infrastructure <laughs> of the country. And the railroad system that, that serves us now goes about four miles an hour faster than it did 100 years ago, and probably over the same track in most places. And it's just high time, if we're going to move forward, if we're going to take advantage of winning the Cold War, and we're going to pay back the taxpayers who put all that money and made all that sacrifice, we owe it to them for a cut of $15 billion out of about $300 billion to spend some money where they live. 
I don't understand this system altogether here. What, what are these? I was, I was turning off Mr. Solomon, who was you, just you, about did to Did you enter. cut me off, no, Jerry? You I him off. <laughs> Would the gentlelady yield? I'd be happy to. You know, it's a shame what's happened to the railroad industry in this country. Here we have the greatest it's nation It's a shame what's happened to the debate that. in this committee. <laughs> yes. Oh, the, Jerry, the shame oh. is that we've debated everything in the world this afternoon except Ike's amendment. And if, if I could just reclaim my time, I, I want to support his ability to put that amendment on the floor. Yeah. Okay. Um, Oh, and Louise, I yeah, would yeah. love to get together and have okay. a good history lesson with all of you sometime, but I'm not sure this We've is already learned so much. Today. Louise, the only thing I was going to say, those trains still run at the same speed as you mentioned earlier. At least we didn't have to change the timetable. <laughs> they didn't get right. there any faster. And, and the only antique ones in the world. Mr. Skelton, if you'd be kind enough to leave, we, we'd stop talking. <laughs> I, I, I can't leave without uh, thanking Mr. Slaughter, number one, for claiming me as a kinsman. <laughs> and, and number two, uh, uh, I, I want to thank her for her support for my right to uh, put this amendment on the floor. It's immensely important. Regardless of one's personal feelings, uh, I think this, this debate should take place, and I thank the uh, members of this committee so much. Thank you. Thus endeth the testimony. The, the, the committee stands in recess until the call of the chair, which the chairman understands from the real chairman, Mr. Moakley, will be in about five minutes. We'll, At which we'll, time, apparently, we'll come back and vote on that. We'll wait around. Please. Try to make it. The Rules Committee will now reconvene. The chair will be in receipt of a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H. Conrad 287 a rule providing for three hours of general debate including one hour of Humphrey Hawkins debate, equally divided and controlled by the chairman and ranking, and ranking minority member of the Budget Committee. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the budget resolution, except for Section 606B of the Congressional Budget Act of 1974. The rule makes in order only the amendments in the nature of a substitute contained in the Rules Committee report to accompany the rule. The substitutes will be considered under the King of the Hill procedure. If more than one is adopted, only the last substitute adopted will be considered as finally adopted. The substitutes will be considered in the following order and manner specified in the report. One, the Danamize substitute, debatable for 30 minutes. Two, the Gratison substitute, which if not offered by Representative Gratison will be the pending question after disposition of the Dynamite substitute, debatable for one hour. And three, the Towns and Delms substitute, debatable for eight hours. The substitutes are not subject to amendment. The rule waives all points of order against the substitutes. The rule also makes an order mathematical consistency amendments if necessary under Section 305A5 of the Congressional Budget Act and if offered by the Budget Committee Chairman. Finally, the rule provides one hour of general debate after disposition of the last substitute. To hear the motion of the gentleman of South Carolina, Mr. Solomon. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I'm just reading, uh, reading through the rule and uh, uh, all of the uh, the times will be div divided equally uh, between the uh, gentleman majority is, of them. Gentleman is correct. Right. Including the, uh, the, te the, te the uh, town's what? Dellum substitute. Well, this guy was proponents and opponents. All right. But it, it is all to be equally divided, though. Yes. Including the town's Dellum. Uh, Absolutely. Right. Okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, we've uh, we've debated this uh, at length, uh, and the time is growing late. Uh, we do have uh, some uh, motions to to uh, offer, and at the appropriate time, I would make them. All right, this is the appropriate time. <laughs> <laughs> Chairman, uh, first of all, uh, I have a motion. Uh, which would uh, amend the rule which would make in order the Solomon Amendment that would strike Section 2 of the budget resolution. And you all have that, uh, that resolution in front of you. Uh, what that does, it strikes out the uh, Plan B, uh, leaves Plan A in its, uh, even though I don't agree with Plan A, but uh, it strikes out that language which allows defense cuts to be spent on domestic programs instead of being used solely to uh, reduce the deficit. 
and uh, I would offer that amendment uh, in hopes that we would have a, a uh, clear-cut vote on that on the issue. Uh, that really is what the Conyers bill is all about. If we were to successfully uh, pass that amendment on the floor, uh, the entire House and the conferees would know exactly where we stand. If that amendment fails, that means that there is support to, uh, to, leave the, to tear down the firewalls. And I think that's what everybody wants to know on both sides of the aisle, uh, and including uh, members of, uh, of your party. So uh, I would hope that you would make that amendment in order, and uh, uh, let's have a chance to debate it on the floor. Mr. Solomon, as we discussed that this morning, we, uh, uh, most of the people uh, thought that that would be a better place in the Carnegie's bill than in, in the budget bill, and as did the uh, chairman of the budget. Question comes to the motion of the, the general from New York, Mr. Solomon. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Mr. Chairman, I would request a recorded vote. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derek? No. Mr. Bielsen? No. Mr. Frost? Yes. Mr. Bonnier? No. Mr. Hall? Mr. Wheat? No. Mr. Gordon? No. Ms. Slaughter? No. Mr. Solomon? Yes. Mr. Quillen? Aye. Mr. Dreyer? Aye. Mr. McEwen? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. On this matter, four members having voted in the affirmative, eight in the negative, the motion to gentleman from New York is kept not carried. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, uh, you weren't here uh, when uh, your colleague and mine, Ike Skelton, appeared before the committee. Uh, but he does have a substitute which would uh, amend uh, uh, the uh, your Democrat substitute uh, to change the uh, defense spending levels to those uh, of the president's proposal and make no other changes. Um, Ike Skelton, I don't have to tell you, is one of the most respected members of this House. He's a member of the Armed Services Committee. At the request of the uh, Chairman of the Armed Services Committee, he went to great length uh, to develop his proposal. And uh, I just think there are members on both sides of the aisle who strongly support that view. And uh, uh, I would hope that we could make that amendment in order and give Mr. Skelton his, uh, his opportunity to debate his position uh, which is represented by a great many people, as I understand it, on your side of the aisle, give them the opportunity to vote on that uh, uh, on that issue, and I would uh, offer that amendment at this time. And Mr. Solomon, as you know, that the when we deal with budgets, we usually <coughs> deal with complete substitutes because uh, it's really not fair to to raise a a budget and not say where the money's coming from. Uh, uh, lower our budget and saying where the money's going to. So on that premise, uh, and I wasn't in the room as you said, uh, I, I would oppose it. Question comes on the motion, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Solomon. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Mr. Chairman, I would ask for a real roll call vote, please. Mr. Chairman. No. Just say a real roll call. <laughs> Mr. Bielinson? No. Mr. Frost? No. Mr. Bonnier? No. Mr. Hall? No. No. <laughs> Mr. Wheat? Aye. Mr. Gordon? No. Ms. Slaughter? Aye. Mr. Solomon? Aye. Mr. Quillen? Aye. Mr. Dreyer? Aye. Mr. McEwen? All right. Mr. Chairman? No. On this matter, six members have a vote in the affirmative, seven in the negative. The amendment of the gentleman from the aye is not carried. Thank you, Mr. All right. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thought one of the most thoughtful presentations given here today was the uh, proposal by our colleague from Florida, Mr. Bennett, in which he uh, outlined uh, the situation from World War I forward, and I thought it was a, a, a very good case for bringing, giving him the opportunity to bring the figures up to what the President said. The President in his State of the Union message said cuts of $50 billion and no more, and I hope very much that this committee will allow uh, Charlie Bennett the opportunity to offer his amendment. I'd move that. My favorite backstroke swimmer, I would have to 
oppose your amendment on the same ground that I oppose uh, the Skelton Amendment. It, it's just a perfect, perfecting <coughs> amendment, and it's not a complete substitute. And it's awful fair to deal with just amendments in the budget process because you have to know where the money's coming from, where it's going, and, and how the thing balances yeah. out. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, I, I believe that the Mr. Bennett's uh, amendment does that. No, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. I, I remember your questions, and, and he mentioned about the various categories. No, and he said I that they would be reduced. They would be reduced uh, sufficiently to handle that. Oh, there's no direction to where the money comes from, though. But he just said they should be reduced. Yeah, he said they should be reduced, but it doesn't say where the money comes from. Well, but he didn't, but the increase is not any more specific than that either. The specific, mm -hmm. the there are the three categories of the firewall. Yeah, the increase has to take the, the oh, up to the president's budget only in defense. And then the, re the reductions in the other two categories would offset that. I mean, it, it's, it's not any less clear in one area than it is in the other. Mm -hmm. Well, it's viewed upon by counsel and myself as a perfecting amendment. And, and our draft calls for substitutes when we're dealing with it. Right here, I'll, I'll just read. In order, the last sentence, in order to achieve the objective of retaining the President's national defense budget figure, the budget figures for all other government functions shall be reduced. All right. Thank you very much. It says, and at the end, insert the following, which means it's a perfecting amendment. Question comes on the motion, gentlemen from California. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 The noes have it. Mr. Chairman. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. No. Mr. Bielenson? No. Mr. Frost? No. Mr. Bonnier? No. Mr. Hall? No. Mr. Mr. Wheat? No. Mr. Gordon? No. Ms. Slaughter? No. Mr. Solomon? Yes. Mr. Quillen? Aye. Mr. Dreyer? Aye. Mr. McEwen? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. On this matter, four members have been voting the affirmative, nine the negative. The motion of the gentleman of California is not adopted. Any other motions, Mr. Smith? Question now comes on the motion of the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Derrick. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 The soft eyes win it. <laughs> of course. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick? Aye. Mr. Bielenson? Aye. Mr. Frost? Aye. Mr. Bonnier? Aye. Mr. Hall? Aye. Mr. Wheat? Aye. Mr. Gordon? Aye. Ms. Slaughter? Aye. Mr. Solomon? No. Mr. Quillen? No. Mr. Dreyer? No. Mr. McEwen? No. Mr. Mr. Chairman? No. No. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Mr. Mr. Solomon said, said uh, uh, no so softly. I, I thought that was, he was waiting in the bushes for me. He was. Nine members have a voting affirmative, four in the negative. The motion of the gentleman from uh, South Carolina is adopted. Yeah. Rules Committee will now. Rules Committee will now be adjourned. Oh, Mr. Chairman. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Who are you assigning to carry the rule on your side? Oh, Mr. Derrick. Oh, and if I might, I would assign Mr. Dreyer to carry it on our side. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. All right. Thank you. Have a good time at the banquet. Thank you. Rules Committee stands adjourned. Hope you feel better tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah.
For more information on this meeting, write to the House Budget Committee at H313 in the Capitol, Washington, D.C., 20515. And keep up with developments in the former Soviet Union by tuning to News One, the evening newscast from Moscow, Russia. News One features stories about unfolding events in the former Soviet Union, as well as international news, sports, and weather. That's News One weeknights at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time, here on C-SPAN 2. Coming up next, a symposium on the media coverage of the recession. So have they. I followed the debate carefully, and I, I really am here just to, to say thank you and to try to say we, we need to finish the job.